Hello, ladies and gentlemen, cyclocross fans and viewers from all around the world. Welcome to today's coverage of the eighth and final stop of the Telenet Super Prestige Series. Today's race being held in Middlekirk of Belgium, the event known as the North Sea Cross, tucked right up along the Belgian coastline in the northwest corner of Belgium, up in West Flanders. This event running its 12th edition here for our elite women's day in Middlekirk. I'm Jeremy Powers, and I'm joined by friend, former competitor, and one of the best co-commentators I know, five-time British national champion, Ian Field. Ian, welcome. Hey, Jeremy. Really looking forward to this final round of the Super Prestige. We've got proper cross conditions today, as they say. Some real muddy, tough conditions. We've had non-stop rain pretty much the last two days. No rain falling from the sky on the day, but it's already done its damage to this course. Yeah, and um, after talking with you a little bit, it uh, sounds like you have a little bit of history with this event, Ian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's quite a famous photo where I got attacked by a Jack Russell going through the sand pit on one of the laps. It was captured by uh, Cycle the Photos. But here we hear Alvarado. Uh, yeah, indeed. Yeah, na het WK heb ik wel best slechte week gehad. Um, best wel wat last gehad en uh, ja, sinds twee dagen dat ik het gevoel heb dat het dan wel uh, terug had ontspant. Maar uh, ja, vandaag weer koers uh, uh, op het programma staan, dus ja, we zullen zien hoe het straks zal gaan. Hoe belastend is dit parcours eigenlijk specifiek voor die rug dan? Je lacht al. Ja, voor de rug is het niet zo goed, nee. <laughs> maar ja, kijk wat ik zeg, we zullen straks zien. Maar hopelijk uh, is het een wat betere dag en, uh, en gaat het goed. En uh, ja, als ik een mindere dag heb, dan uh, heb ik pech en dan uh, ja, zal het wel ontwikkelen zijn. Want het gaat natuurlijk ook nog echt wel ergens om vandaag. Jij kunt die superprestige nog winnen. Ja, ja, ja. Het ziet er heel goed uit zelfs. Wat zeg je? Het ziet er zelfs heel goed uit. Uh, ja, voorlopig nog wel. <laughs> Hopelijk straks ook. Ik uh, ga zeker mijn best doen om het, om het vandaag te verdedigen. Hoe vettig ligt het er eigenlijk bij, het parcours? Uh, enorm eigenlijk. Ik had niet gedacht dat het uh, zo modderig uh, ging zijn. Het is echt wel uh, sommige stukjes stoempen, heel glad. Um, ja, bijna alle knikjes die er zijn moet je lopen. Dus, uh, en sommige tussenstukken ook. Dus uh, ja, het zal nog uh, spektakel zijn. De vorm zit nog altijd goed, het hele seizoen eigenlijk al. Maar ik denk dat dat vandaag ook echt wel nodig gaat zijn op dit parcours, niet? Ja, het is heavy vandaag. Um, ik had wel verwacht dat dat vettig ging zijn, maar het bolt echt niet. Er zijn stroken dat je echt moet oppassen dat je niet over kop gaat. Uh, het zuigt echt enorm hard. Ja, het is uh, geen prettige omloop vandaag. Waar hoop je op vandaag? Goh, ja, als ik in een top 5 kan rijden, dan, dan denk ik dat dat goed is. Ik zit meer met morgen in mijn achterhoofd. Daar, daar heb ik echt wel hogere ambities dan vandaag. Dat ligt me ook beter, denk ik. Maar um, ja, kijken waar dat we uitkomen vandaag. Annemarie Worst, hoeveel geloof heb jij nog in een eindzege in de superprestige? <laughs> weet je, alles kan het, weet je natuurlijk. Maar er moet wel heel veel gebeuren, denk ik, omdat dat, dat, dat lukt. Dus, uh, ja, het gaat lastig worden, dat is gewoon realistisch. Hè? Maar uh, ja, daar ben ik ook niet aan bezig. Ik weet het gaat heel moeilijk zijn. En de tweede plek is ook nog wel mooi na mijn seizoen. Dus uh, ja, daar ga ik er maar voor. Hoe voelen de benen eigenlijk nog zo aan het einde van het seizoen? Uh, zwaar, lastig. Maar het is ook gewoon een hele lastige cross. Het ligt gewoon heel slecht bij. En als dan iets minder zwaar erbij ligt, dan kan je er nog wel wat makkelijk doorheen. Dan voel je wat minder. Maar nu het is het gewoon een hele zware cross. Aniek van Alphen, en zo maak jij plots ineens kans op het podium in de superprestige door die afwezigheid van Inge van der Rijden. Daar wil jij gebruik van maken, neem ik aan? Uh, ja, natuurlijk. Ik vind het wel heel erg jammer voor Inge, maar uh, ja, dat is natuurlijk topsport. Uh, ik ben zelf ook ziek geweest uh, en toch mindere wedstrijden gehad. Uh, dus ja, ik hoop dat ik toch hier nu die derde plek nog kan uh, behalen. Inge van der Rijden is dus ziek, want we hebben die reden van afwezigheid niet meteen meegekregen. Ja, ja ze heeft een, een virus, dus, uh, ja, waardoor dat ze even mo ja, eerder het seizoen moeten beëindigen. En dat is wel uh, ja, spijtig. Lucinda Brandt, ik heb nog niet veel mensen heel erg gelukkig gehoord over de staat van dit parcours. Want het is super lastig, maar ik denk wel, jou ligt dat ook. Ja, lastigheid ligt me op zich wel, maar het is wel een rondje waar ik nou niet uh, altijd echt de flow vind, moet ik heel eerlijk bekennen. Het zijn allemaal van die uh, rare bultjes die er liggen en inderdaad uh, met deze omstandigheden zijn ze er niet makkelijker op geworden. 
Dus ook jij bent niet super gelukkig nu. <laughs> Als ik een heel eerlijk kleur beken, dan kom ik altijd al een beetje met uh, dichtgeknepen billen hier naartoe gereisd. <laughs> Well, Ian, any thinks, any uh, any thoughts on what we uh, heard there from maybe some of the top riders, maybe Alvarado as a start? Yeah, so Alvarado leading the Super Prestige overall coming into this race has announced that this will be her final race of the season. She's been suffering with those ongoing back problems that have plagued her since kind of the Christmas period, really. So she just wants to try and wrap up the Super Prestige today. She has a slight buffer over Anna Marie Verst in uh, second. If Anna Marie wins, then Alvarado has to be in the top six. So uh, one point going down. So 15 for the win, 14 for second, and so on for the top 15 riders. That's how the overalls worked out. And she was just saying she's going to get through today as best as possible. It's, they were all saying it's a really, really tough course with the mud, really hard going. Um, Suits brand, she's looking forward to this one. Uh, but Don Scott, confident. She's coming off the back of a win from uh, Maldegum on Wednesday and a very good World Championships result as well, fifth at those. And then there are the battles for the overall as well, Inca van der Heinden versus Van Alphen. That's kind of the closest battle, that third and fourth in the overall. But there's Sanakant, who we didn't hear from, but a five times winner here in Middelkerke. Right. What about uh, what about Anna Marie Verst? Uh, second overall in this series, only six points from the lead, having a very consistent season. She is. Um, I think she's kind of laughing about trying to take the win. Um, she knows it's a tall order, but you never know. You never know when a competitor is struggling with injury. Alvarado has shown in the past week's four foot world championships that perhaps those back problems aren't quite as bad anymore. Like she's completing races to a very high standard. It isn't locking up and she's like falling back through the field rapidly, like often happens with a bad back. So she just needs another good 40, 45 minutes of racing and uh, she'll wrap this one up hopefully. Another rider we didn't hear from, Leonie Bentveld, on the uh, going to be on the front row here, I believe. The third, the rider that got third at the Under-23 Women's World Championships was second on Wednesday in the mid-week uh, race in Malvahem. What do you think of her chances today? She has shown some very, very good form. In fact, I think before Tabor, I'd have probably said these conditions aren't the best for Bentveld. However, she showed there on one of the hardest courses of the year to be one of the fittest, fiercest competitors on the circuit. And so, yeah, she's going to be an outside bet for a podium today for sure. Well, the riders are going to be here on this uh, very historic track, one of the oldest crosses, I believe, outside of the World Championships and the Belgian Championships today here in Maldehem. Um, some different uh, pieces to the course, running it a little bit differently than previous editions, having to make some changes as we see Marianne Norbert Riberola there. This is Leonie Bentveld, who we were just talking about, third uh, at the Under-23 Women's World Championships in Tabor just a couple of days ago, now second in Maldehem at the midweek race. That's Salen Del Carmen Alvarado, her mom. Her team giving her a little bit of a peck on the cheek there and a big uh, punch out just to get this one started. This is again Alvarado's last race of the year after her back problems. They're running a, uh, we call it a mini mud, but that's an FMB style tread. This is Braun here running that uh, Dugast Rhino that she's very well known for here and definitely the favorite today, I think, Ian. Exactly. In these conditions, when it just comes down to an absolute fitness test in the deep mud, Brand comes to the fore more often than not, coming off that second place at the World Championships, only beaten by, how do we even describe Fen Van Empel this year? <laughs> only beaten by Fen Van Empel on the day as we see the rest of the front row. Um, interesting, Judy Browers on that second row running the Griffo tread. So the majority of riders going for the mud or the mini mud, but some of the riders taking a bit of a risk, bit of a gamble for that Griffo or Typhoon tread. Yeah, and this is the last person. Why number one, Sana Kant. The organizers are able to give that number one to whomever they want, so they give it to the Belgian champ today. <laughs> The riders are ready, focused, down on the start line. You can see everybody tense as this last and final round of the Super Prestige gets ready to kick off. The gentleman there with the hood on is going to be moving out to the side, and then he's going to wait for the lights to go green.
Green means go, and they're off for this final round of the Super Prestige here in Middle Kirka. Off to the front, it's Laura Verdanschgott right there with Leonie Bedfeld. They're going to be ripping down this asphalt just to get to that first turn first. Here we go, Ian. It's all for play today. Just like everyone got a pretty good start. All of the favorites made a good one. This tight right hand it just goes to show how important that start is straight into the deep mud. It's kind of almost a bit of wasteland between the road and where kind of the town is on the coast. And it gets really, really muddy in places. But right now, Alvarado leads from Brand and Bentfeld. Yeah, Alvarado here just having to jump off. This part of the course clearly not rideable. And we're going to start to see from the riders, Ian, I think a little bit of this, just, you know, how they're looking at this track. But already problems for Alvarado down in that first turn. She wasn't even on her machine. So that's, you know, not riding, already falling down on this track. Exactly. It would be good to get a replay of exactly what happened there, whether she did try and remount at the top of that bank. She did. Ah. She goes to remount and just... Front end tucks underneath her on that cambered uh, small descent, loses a few places, but right now Brand out front. Yeah, that's tough. You know, you know exactly as I do that uh, putting a hand in the mud first things never, never the way you want to start your day off because it's just all your controls and your hands all muddy and everything's just harder to harder to work with from straight out the gate. Exactly, that right hand of hers covered in that kind of wet mud. She'll be trying to kind of get that dry and clean as possible, wiping it on the skin suit as she goes. But we're seeing right now kind of the middle Kirker course at its best, just these lots of these punchy small bankings that the riders have to traverse up, across and back down. And it makes for very, very tricky conditions when the riders can't carry the speed that they'd normally want to into these, making a lot of on and off the bike. See these bankings in the past, quite easy to ride in fast conditions, but now must have had three or four dismounts already in this opening lap for these riders. Yeah, really big ditch there and yeah, that's what that's what I think that the riders are going to be thinking a lot about is just that uh, inability to see exactly what's lurking there from when they pre-rode this probably you know just before the junior races went off oh no and problems here for number 27 that looks to be uh, Tiger Lil Harnick there just having a problem there so uh, this, oh no we're gonna get a replay of this one again yeah just goes down that bank in and these bankings are so so steep that you end up with quite a big compression at the bottom and just uh, the bike washed away from her on that compression at the bottom of that descent but you see these conditions really testing these top riders again Alvarado paddles her way through that other riders having to jump off kind of almost looks nothing on our TV screens but right now Brand beginning to just open up that gap now through the first pit on this opening lap yeah, seeing two of our former competitors there, Rob Peters as well as Camille Vandenberg. They're giving each of their riders, uh, for Rob Peters, it would be Laura Verdanschgott. For uh, Camille Vandenberg, it would be the triple seven reds that he's out there yelling uh, information to. We know Alvarado's got her family out there and the Alpeson de Kunick team, so everyone got their, uh, got their crew on the side, hoping for an overall victory today for Camille Vandenberg and the Cyclocross Reds team. Exactly that. Brand just riding her own tempo right now. It's one of those courses we've already seen mistakes creeping in when you kind of try and take a section of the course a little bit too fast or perhaps go into the red for a little bit too long. But Alvarado looks good in second. We said that back problems that did plague her around kind of the Christmas period just after seem to have got a little bit better, but they're obviously not 100% given that she's uh, going to close out her season today. Brand once more up to another banking. Yeah, Brand. Not, uh, definitely not immune. You get a lot of adrenaline in this first lap of the race, Ian. And then you're, you know, out in the front and you're doing everything that you can. And she's just trying to stay smooth to keep this gap going. Looks to be that she's on a really good day. She's riding strong. But this course, I would say, one of the more technical middle kirkas that I've seen. You know, you got to all these different conditions, but look how deep this mud is. This is going to really, for someone like Alvarado, this is really going to be hard on your back. Lots of low cadence things and uh, lots of on and off of the bike, right? They're off their bike just as much as they're on it at the moment. For sure. And in her interview, she basically said it was kind of the worst course for her back, yeah. really. But yeah. right now, she's, she's looking good. And yeah, I don't think I've ever quite seen we've had some really muddy additions of this race in the past but never the mud quite this thick and tough going like riders almost struggling to ride just on the flat there up to the planks for the first time no chance of riding them today for these women no 
No, and then you can see now Braun here on one of these uh, sections that's a little bit drier, which is exactly how I recall this course myself. Um, lots of different conditions now as they get to one of these very tricky off cameras. Braun probably having been able to ride that section in her pre-ride, able to just kind of kick and paddle her way through that. Some ruts here, and we're just getting a, a little bit of a close-up shot of just how, how heavy this is. Ian, I would expect Braun to be going in for a bike change, uh, if not a uh, second time through the pits, uh, very much into that first pit on this second lap. We're definitely going to be seeing regular bike changes, see how thick the mud is and how badly it's kind of flicking up on the downshift. Oh, Benfeld cool. just uh, got cross right there. <laughs> There's lots and lots of deep ruts around the surface changes. You see there kind of a hard standing path section and then just either side of it, the mud is really, really deep. So uh, you have to hit those as square as possible and remain in a straight line for as long as possible through those ruts. Because yeah, if you begin to kind of weight goes to one side, the bike flicks out the end of those ruts and sends you flying across the course and see how much time that cost a really good example of there, leaning her upper body to try and keep that bike in a straight line. But we've got the two overall protagonists there in second and third right now. Anna Marie Verse will need some people to come up to that battle and get in between her and Alvarado if she is going to challenge her for the overall. That's probably a good tactic today for Alvarado, you know, knowing that she is sort of nursing a bit of a, a back injury here and knowing how heavy the course was. You know, if Braun's on a good day, let her go. Let me fight this thing out with Honor Reverse with someone that I know I could keep good pace with. As we see now, Braun coming into the sand for the first time. Although the precipitation made the other parts of the course really muddy, Ian, it really changed this part of the course and made it quite rideable. Exactly. Um, sand becomes a lot easier when it's been rained on. It just kind of packs down and the riders get quite a big open ledge to ride straight through today. And even the ruts are kind of well solid, well formed. And uh, yeah, like you said, makes this section of the course a lot easier than previous years. We've seen previous years riders struggling to ride that double sand pit section. But more on and off the bike for Brand through these very tricky uh, ups and downs and those deep ruts at the bottom of each one. We get a nice slow-mo of Alvarado pushing her way through one of those deep mud sections. Anna Marie Verse there. Looks to be on a really good day. And not on a course that I would say that is, is perfect for Anna Marie Verse. Typically a rider that does super good on really fast tracks. And that's where she won those uh, bands that are on her arm. Uh, those are the European champ bands when she was won that race in the Netherlands. So, yeah, great to see that uh, she's holding her own. Talking about Anna Marie Verse here in such a muddy race as we see Braun there going through the pits for the first time today. Yeah, in for that bike change as we thought, but interesting the two riders behind not going in to change. Yeah, that was interesting. I'm, I, I, we haven't seen them go in yet, but perhaps they're feeling like maybe the other side of the pit, maybe the second half is, uh, is, is maybe better suited for them or they feel it's a little bit faster and they're just waiting for that. But I agree with you that they, they must be going in very soon. It might be the fact that the mud is so thick when it's sometimes so thick that it actually doesn't kind of flick up into the drive chain quite as much as you think. And it's just the kind of the tires that are filling up. So these two feeling like the gears are all good. The bike's not too heavy. It hasn't kind of flicked up too much onto that down tube as we see. So yeah, not going in for a bike change just yet but Brand's in the perfect position right now. In these conditions, you just kind of want to be out on your own, choosing your line. Oh, problem there for Anna Marie Verse. Just gets caught up on that banking. Just came yeah, to a halt at the tough. top of there. Yeah, that's going to be tough to get over. And now Ben Veld, as well as Verdanschgott, going to be smelling a little bit of blood in the water as they look at that last spot on the podium. Verdanschgott doing an amazing job at the end of the season. Fifth at the Worlds. Uh, really good ride in Malvahem. I Anything's possible for her today. Yeah, for sure. She's just come good at exactly the right time in the season. And these deep, muddy conditions really do suit her as a rider. I mean, she does well in some of the faster races as well, but we saw at the Belgian Championships how close she pushed Sana Kant for that record-breaking title all the way down to the line. And she's making her way through now, just up and over Bentfeld after one lap of racing. Quite a long lap, almost nine minutes. 
Yeah, really, really long lap. 25 seconds to Alvarado, 26 seconds to first. Verdon Scott coming there. So we've got quite a few riders here in that top 10. I'll get you that just as soon as we get uh, some, some of the live timing down. But now we can see Braun still not playing games. 25 seconds in that first lap. I'm not surprised yet. She had a very, very clean uh, first lap, and she's riding super strong. She's very efficient on and off of her machine. She looks to have done her homework here. You know, she really knows where she can ride things, where she can get off. And, um, you know, I think for, for Alvarado, I, I do think the tactic of letting someone like Braun go right away if she's not feeling like 100% and doesn't want to push it with her back. Really, the goal for Alvarado today to look out for this overall title. She's already taken the World Cup overall, which we know comes with quite a hefty overall prize purse. This race for the women, 25,000 euros to win the overall of this, and Alvarado's in prime position. So, you know, Ian, what do you think? Play it safe for Alvarado, and this is a good tactic? 100%. Uh, there's no point following Brand, going into the red, making a mistake and falling behind and perhaps bringing more riders into play for that overall in terms of getting between her and Anna, Anna Marie Verst. As you say, there's a large prize pot on offer today, so she just wants to kind of get out, get clear, ride her own pace. And yeah, if that's good enough on the day to take it out, then that's the best option for her. She doesn't want to get caught up. But even this course catching Brand out now, her unable to ride up that banking as she was on the previous lap you see how difficult how treacherous these small bankings are yeah i mean for me the thing that's the the most dangerous on this track isn't any of the muddy part it's those drops it's the it's where those drops kind of where all that pressure all that downward force kind of compresses right at the bottom of those small descents that they're going into you would remember as well as i do ian that those little troughs that they've got at this track this is what this course is really well known for and they're dangerous you know that's why the riders are choosing to get off and run over them the, the, the reality is is that one of them can gobble up a front wheel like we saw from that other rider earlier and put you into one of those metal barricades there and those don't move and neither do the uh, wooden poles that they're sitting over so those things are not a, a, a risk that you really want to mess with you're going to be confined to the uh, to where they've set those in that course that they've got there you know if you want to take the risk getting close to it by all means but you definitely do not want to hit one that could be a broken finger or, or worse exactly and I think they've almost put in more of these small bankings in the course this year don't quite remember as many as we're seeing whether it's just the conditions making ones that in the past have been relatively easy to fly an up and over with good speed whereas in these conditions just almost the smallest smallest of bankings now becoming uh, having to get off and back on as we see Santa Kant not having one of her best days out on a course that she's had so much success at in the past. Looking back at Brand, actually a course where she's never actually won. She's had a, a third um, and a second on this course, but never actually won in Middlekirka. As we see those riders that didn't take a bike on the previous lap now in for a clean machine. Yeah, they're definitely, they're going here. And you can see Verdun got there on the rivet. You can see the look on her face. Benfeld there grabbing a fresh, fresh bike, just coming right up, trying to do everything she can. Anik Van Alpha there just on the back right, not taking a bike this lap. But Braun here continuing to just kind of churn out the pace, doing that nine, nine plus minute lap last time. Alvarado doing a really good job to stay kind of just right in the center here. Um, and getting a little bit of distance on Anna Marie Verst after uh, Verst just had a little bit of a problem on one of these small inclines here. Lots of bumps, lumps, uh, ditches, and uh, little things here to uh, get you messed up here in Middle Kirk. If you're just joining us, we're here for the eighth round of the Telenet Super Prestige here, the North Sea Cross up in the topmost left corner of Belgium uh, in the West Flanders region. Beautiful area for cyclocross. We have some very dedicated fans out here as we see uh, Braun there, followed by Alvarado, followed by Verse here on the second lap of this one. It's a beautiful series, the oldest series, Ian, in the entire, uh, in the entire cyclocross circuit. It certainly is and kind of holds such prestige within our sport of cyclocross and yeah, just shown with the prize pot on offer, equal prize money between the men's and the women's categories, which is absolutely brilliant. And it looks like Alvarado doing a good job. Every pedal stroke taking her closer to that prize pot over the planks once more. Anna Marie Verse just making her way back. But I think it was a great example, that problem that she had coming to a halt on one of those bankings, how quickly you can lose time by not carrying that momentum. This course, all about carrying momentum, never coming to a halt on one of those bankings, getting off before you need to, jumping back on when you have good speed in the bike, not coming to a halt after remounting. So really testing the rider's skills with uh, decision-making today. Riders here 
doing something that you don't usually see, where you get the bike and normally you just put it out to your side, go over the planks, and then you're off and running. On that section, they're actually grabbing the bike by the top or the down tube, and then they're putting it up on the shoulder because they've got so much further to run because the section after it's so unrideable that they're actually just putting that bike up on their shoulder uh, as, a, as a way to keep the bike from having to push it through the mud. It's kind of wild to see that. You don't, you don't always see where you know that. And, and in this case, normally the promoter just take the planks out because there's already so much running. I always think that, however, it has got sponsors plastered across those planks who have probably paid a decent <laughs> amount of money. So that's probably why they're kept in. They're certainly not kept in, uh, yeah, because the riders need to get off their bikes more than uh, what there already is. But like you yeah. say, having to run the flat mud sections, get that bike up onto the shoulder, out of that mud, out of the way, so you can run that bit freer through that section. It's gonna be a hard. It's gonna be a hard, uh, hard race. I think that the lap times I would expect to go out a little bit um, on such a heavy course. They're gonna do five laps. If we saw the first lap around 10 minutes, Ian. I expect that they'll run this right just at 50 minutes, even maybe a touch over. It's gonna be a long race. It's gonna be certainly longer than the World Championships. We saw a bit of a short race for these women at the World Championships, but Brand, just riding that corner, nice. So important just to stay in the rut. Um, stay on that flat kind of patted down sand that the riders have made for themselves and speeding up through their exiting well. Braun looking really, really focused here as she comes through everything that she can just to keep this lead up. She wants to just continue to build that lead and not make any major mistakes. You can see there she lost a little momentum as she hopped off there. So maybe some small little teeny little errors for Braun, but it won't be it won't all be perfect on a course like this. It, not for anyone, not for any of the you know men or even if a Femme Van Empel or a Puck Peterson was here. Everyone on a course like this, Ian, has problems on the day. They're gonna have some mistake, a foot down, a bobble, a bike that slides out that's just kind of the name of the game with conditions uh, as treacherous and as tough as these ones exactly and it's kind of conditions where when you were racing you'd make a mistake and kind of beat yourself up a little bit and then you'd get home and watch the replay on tv and realize that everyone was making mistakes and you you were just kind of as good or as bad as everyone else on the day because it's such tricky conditions at, as you say kind of very slick in places but also deep heavy ruts at the bottom of these compressions makes it very very difficult to maintain momentum through different sections of the course but once more brand sticking to the plan that fresh clean trek bike that she's now on changing once per lap taking no risks clean drive chain clean tires and uh, into this very very tricky section this is the section of the course that Anna Marie Verst had trouble with see how important it is catches brand out this time yeah, and then once you lose that momentum, this is where we're talking about losing a lot of time now, Ian. This is what I was talking about. This is where you're just, Braun just shipped about 10 seconds on that section with the first bobble and then the second one. It'll be interesting to see if Braun, next lap, being such a such the racer that she is, if she kind of clicks and saves that portion of the course and chooses, I'm just going to run this whole thing next lap. Yeah, obviously got kind of a little bit worse compared to the first lap as we see Alvarado on that section of the course now see if she can make it through clean for the first time it seems the riders no once more having to get off seems to be that kind of that fourth hill has really got a lot worse since these riders practiced the course those ruts getting very very deep and once more and a reverse with a foot down at the top not too bad it's all about carrying speed from one to the next and these riders unable to do so that lap but brand round once more 18 minutes of racing done yeah, that section, that, that lump that they're getting hung up on looks super steep, and it looks like it's really rutted in the bottom. It just, as they try to push that tire through that really thick, sloppy mud at the bottom, then they're getting right into like a, a it just takes all of their momentum out of their uh, speed, and then they're kind of like, get to the top, and they just can't quite get there. And then you know how awkward it is to be trying to get off your bike on a hill and do the whole thing. So, yeah, right now, Alvarado coming through. Did take a, a little bit of time out of her still, but she's continuing to hold really well at 30 seconds back. So, right now, it's at the front. Braun, followed by Alvarado, followed by Anna Marie Verse and Laura Verdanschgott, seemingly coming together there just at the back. So, the top four already through, I believe, to see Anik Van Alpha there sitting in fifth spot. They're the teammate of Anna Marie Verse back there in fifth. But Braun here putting on a bit of a clinic as she rips these sections, but definitely looking to feel the fatigue as she hasn't even quite hit the halfway point yet. So anything is possible here. But uh, right now, Braun looking very, very strong as she goes over one of these iconic banks here in Middlekirka.
For Don Scott right now is the woman on the move, moving up towards that third place and Anna Marie Verst as we see Alvarado running that section, that long run section towards the beginning of the lap. Brand has only done one Super Prestige race this season and she uh, took out a second place. So hasn't really contested this series like Alvarado and Anna Marie Verst. So she's kind of out of the overall Ooh, Alvarado just uh, <laughs> slinging the bike down that hillside. Yeah, you can tell that she's sort of the, the one being a bit hunted right now. You know, she realizes that there's this kind of this pressure in the back and that, you know, if Verdun Scott is coming up to, um, yeah, to Anna Marie Verst, then she's going to be doing everything that she can to just hold them back. But you can see how they're coming together. And there's only seven seconds, so she knows that Anna Marie Verst and Verdun Scott, she needs to put the pressure on as they come together because it's definitely going to be, uh, it's going to be one of those momentum things. But Verdun Scott gone straight through Anna Marie Verst and now coming up to Alvarado. Saw Alvarado there just struggling with the shoes on that remount, getting the clipped back in for those next double descents and ended up going down no footed. That's kind of the last thing you want to be in that situation. Feet out, sat on the saddle through one of those compressions at the bottom there. Brand choosing to get off and run that very small mud section. But Don Scott, look at the power and the speed up over the top of Alvarado. Yeah, look at that, taking that outside line, very clean, pushing Alvarado to the outside there. Like I said, she's got that forward momentum. She just won the Wednesday race after Worlds in Maldahem, the midweek race. Just got fifth at the World Championships for Laura Verdanschkat. Talking on her Instagram, she said, uh, basically, uh, in so many words, I can't believe that I did this. And so she is on an absolute tear. She's on the team, I believe, of Ellen Van Loy, if I'm not mistaken, Ian. And she's uh, she's really doing a good job at the end of this year, really putting it all together. And uh, she's been a rider we've talked about for years, but she has seriously found something within herself to start putting this end of this year all together. She's a top competitor. And I think if you think about the Belgian championships and this legacy that Sana Kant leaves after so many victories, she could be heir apparent to the throne here. For sure, eight wins this season and that first big win in Belgium on Wednesday. Like you say, a televised cross in Belgium took out the win. And look at the way she's moved through this field over the course of these first two and a half laps. Looks like the strength is just sapping ever so slightly from Alvarado, whether it is that back problem tightening up ever so slightly, but that's going to give Anna Marie Verst hope. Gets a little kind of pep talk from the mechanic as he hands up that next clean bike. Yeah, they're all suffering, though, and, and not exactly what I would expect. I mean, these were the hardest crosses, Ian, uh, I, for, especially for me. You know, you just, it's a constant ballet dance out there, on, off the bike, low cadence, high cadence, make sure you set up for this turn, remember to get off here, oh, it changed from the last lap. You know, this is this is cross, but this is a hard course to memorize with so many different uh, obstacles and, and sections that are just evolving as the course uh, uh, continues to go through each lap. That's the thing, it's changing each lap. So these riders rode some sections clean on the first lap and then they come around again for the second lap and another 25, 30 women have gone up over these bankings, blown out a rut, made kind of one banking more slipperier than it was before. And so you have to adapt to the conditions, adapt to the course as it changes. Yeah, for sure. We're done, Scott. Bike up onto the shoulder here, ripping through each of these parts of the course, riding in a a short sleeve jersey today, feeling like that was uh, that was going to be warm enough for her. Conditions not bad out here, somewhere around uh, 48 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're joining us uh, in the U.S., nine degrees uh, Celsius. So, so it's not not bad, not bad for a cyclocross. Uh, I personally would have worn a long sleeve jersey, but uh, you know that's right in the middle as one of the lapped riders just sits on the side there, so Braun can rip through and um, take that section cleanly. We saw our last couple of laps sliding out there, but that's one of the parts of the course Ian, that looks like it's it's evolved enough so that it's a little drier. It certainly has, and I think actually the lap rider there almost helped her. It forced her higher up that banking at the beginning of it, so she got nice and high and then was able to ride like a really nice line across that camber rather than trying to start too low. So uh, although she had to go up and over that rider, it probably helped her ride that section clean. Yeah. Bentfeld now just uh, choosing to put the bike down. That's one of the things about the fatigue there, I think, that you just see is like it's harder to run with the bike up on your shoulder. It's the better option to do, but the fatigue setting in, as we see now, Laura Verdon just got there, the wheel app just slipping out as she goes through, but she's able to ride that section. These are the parts of the course, I think, Ian, that start to add up to a lot of seconds, right? If we see that Alvarado um, on a reverse, cannot ride that with that same speed and have to put a foot down or something, oof, a little slide out there for 
for Braun. That's where those seconds start to add up over the course of the uh, 50 minutes. They do, if you stall kind of on uh, two or three of these hillsides in one lap, that can easily be 10, 12 seconds, just a foot down, bike comes to a stop, have to get going again. Kind of the worst situation you can end up is both feet down either side of the bike and you have to paddle your way almost to the top and then jump on the bike from a really awkward position. And we've seen some riders almost getting into that position today. Very, very tricky as we saw Brand through one of those really deep ruts. The bike kind of fired out the other side and just lost grip on that front tire and nearly went down. Ian, when you're talking about um, how prestigious this series is, we've got the World Cup, of course. We've got the X2O Trophy, which is the other big series. Then you've got the Super Prestige, you've got the Exact Cross. In your opinion, where does the Super Prestige rank for the riders? Ooh, that's a tough one, <laughs> I just said. Um, probably second behind the World Cup. However, in recent years, potentially, um, due to the changes with the World Cup, some of the riders not wanting to do all of the rounds now, um, have concentrated on the Super Prestige instead. But yeah, I just said definitely second. Um, it's been going for so long. The prize pot is so good. And I think you can always tell a great series because it hasn't had to change its name over the years from the from the 80s Super Prestige, such an iconic name in the sport of cyclocross, and you see why these top top riders come and battle week in week out in this series. Yeah, often intimidated, never replicated. I think uh, no one really has a series at the same level as this. It's been packing, you know, venues for the better part of uh, cyclocross history. Uh, it's really one of the ones that everyone knows. If you get a, a contract. To the Super Prestige Series as a pro rider, meaning you know they, they pay you to start um, on top of this equal prize money that they have for both the men and the women and the, the super professional um, environments that they create for the riders. Yeah, it's an absolute win-win for everyone. It's a beautiful series and one that's really well known. Everyone wants to win this for Alvarado. This will be her third time being able to win this series. If she's able to stick in this one and not lose anything, she's already won the World Cup this year, Ian. So to do the double, that's pretty special. You know, winning the World Cup overall, winning the Super Prestige overall. She won it last year. Um, she's she's on a she's on a tear. She's she's won this actually. She's won the Super Prestige two other occasions last year and another time, and then she's looking at a third time this year. So, oof, big problems for Anna Marie Verse there. Just that U-turn at the end of the sand pit where they have to double back on themselves. Looked like she just got caught out a little bit on that rut that has formed on that corner. And now the only Bentfeld up to her wheel. So problems for Anna Marie Verst. Maybe saying goodbye to any chances now of overhauling Alvarado in that overall competition. But Brand just rode this section that Verdun Scott's on now just beautifully, just attacked it a lot more. And you could see the body language, the power through the pedals, just carrying much more speed through that section. And this time, not a problem for Verdun Scott either. Yeah, now Alvarado. Yes, this is this is one of those sections. Um, if you're watching on the TV here, this is where the Alvarado is losing a few seconds each lap, and this is where Verdun Scott, uh, as well as Braun, are starting to really open things up, take time back from uh, from each of those riders looking for those podium positions. So Braun now looking really smooth there as she unclips, pre-unclips, and gets off her machine, leading, taking all that momentum into this one and getting that bike right up onto her shoulder. <laughs> Alvarado there losing just a little bit of time as she comes through about a minute and four seconds back on now on Mushin Nebron. I think she's going to be doing everything that she can to just stick on the podium. You know, it would be really nice, I think, for Braun Ian to be able to take a podium here on this uh, final uh, round of the Telling That Super Prestige and then, you know, switch out to, uh, to the overall to be able to go up there to take that first spot on the podium as well for the overall title. Exactly, as we see uh, Bentfeld up to Anna Marie Verst, but wasn't able to take that momentum over the top of Verst. Here comes Norbert Riverola. Loves these tough conditions. Didn't get the greatest of first laps, but now she's moving through really strong. Another rider that didn't have the greatest of first laps was Lara Vodonskot, but has come super, super strong towards the end of this race. Van 
Sandra had also there, shipping a little bit of time. She was talking about, you know, how hard top sport was in her interview when we heard from Inga van der Heide. She had a crash there in Spain um, at the World Cup down there and didn't have the World Championships that she wanted, but such a strong rider and uh, would love to see uh, how she is able to kind of bring the rest of her season up as she goes on here throughout this one. She's had one podium in the Super Prestige this series. Like you said, 12th at Tabor, probably would have been hoping more. Only one win this season, but on this course, she's, her best result's actually only a ninth three years ago. So perhaps a course that just doesn't suit her skill set, one that she doesn't have great fond memories of. So it's always difficult coming to a venue, knowing that perhaps the course doesn't suit your kind of physiology, your skills. So uh, she's doing a good ride for herself at the moment. As we see Don Scott up and over there, one of the few riders to carry that amount of speed up over that section. But this one of the blown out sections that's got a lot, lot worse as this race has gone on. Yeah, Braun here choosing for that big uh, Rhino tire. Ian, what do you think of uh, Alvarado's choice to go with the mini mud on this one? Uh, that uh, FMB tire, a little less aggressive, a little faster, um, and looks to be navigating these sections quite well. What's, uh, you know, you're very extensive in your, uh, in your tire knowledge. What do you think of Alvarado's choice to go with a little bit uh, of a lesser mud tire for this one? Quite interesting to see. I would have thought perhaps that's why she's uh, struggled on some of the bankings. She hasn't been able to ride as many of the ups as some of the other riders, including Brand and Vadon Scott. So I would have thought perhaps that, that smaller tread took her maybe a little bit of a risk that will help on kind of these sections that we're seeing Brand on right now. So that tread will be yeah. faster on these sections, but it's probably costing her a little bit on some of the bankings that we've seen her struggle on through this race. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you weren't with us at the start, Alvarado choosing uh, at the start line uh, a lesser mud tire, a little less aggressive, whereas Braun going with the traditional Dugas Rhino tire, very, very heavy tire. But it also takes a ton of power to push these big mud tires. They've got big, long, uh, floppy lugs attached to them, and they, uh, they're they really hard. But, man, Verdansk got not out of sight, out of mind. Alvarado still very much in this for potentially a second place here today in, uh, in Middle Kirka. She is she's recovering well. She had a couple of mistakes, but here comes Norbert Ribarola through this group now, up and over, Anna Marie Verst, and I'm sure she's going to be past Leone Bentfeld within the next half a lap, coming super strong, that rider now. Anna Marie Verst, very consistent all throughout this Super Prestige series, currently sitting in second overall, was one of the riders that could potentially have knocked uh, Alvarado out of this one, and uh, at the end of this one, looking at 16,000 euros for the overall. So the first place at this, 25,000 euros, 16,000 euros for second place, 10,000 euros for third place overall, 7,500 for fourth place, 4,000 euros for fifth place. Now, all of these riders, this is the same for both the men's and the women's, so equal prize money across, but all of the riders in this one, Ian, are gonna be thinking about that as they uh, really choose, like, you know, some days you're motivated for different reasons, but I think, you know, for these riders that make a living from this sport and do that, definitely gonna be trying to put together their absolute best and the most complete cross when, um, when they know so much is on the line. 100%. It's a it's a really good payday payday for the overall in the Super Prestige. I think a few years ago, uh, this rider on screen now, Alvarado, was um, from prize money alone. She won the most money out of all the men and the women put together. So it just goes to show, kind of how much money that can be won through these very prestigious overall titles. Yes, yes, I remember. I remember that was published in the uh, in the, the local Belgian paper. Uh, those exact numbers, but I. I can't remember them, and I don't want to ever. I don't want to repeat something that I can't remember vividly. So, but it was not chump change. Let's put it that way. It was quite a bit of cash. So, uh, it's great to see. Uh, it's great to see that these riders are, are doing it. They are the stars of this sport. They deserve to be uh, well compensated for for all their efforts. As we see now, like you said, a lot of forward momentum here for Marion Norbert Reberol. She's doing a really good job, and like you said, on conditions that really suit her riding style. Probably hasn't had the season that perhaps she would have wanted and we haven't always seen her at her very best but coming really good towards the end of the year and kind of rapidly coming through those chases and making her way towards that third place you see how aggressive she is just the momentum that she's carrying through that section probably faster than any other rider right now through there 
Yeah, yeah absolutely uh, ripping it right there. Already fifth in Maldahem, 16th in Tabor, 29th in Hugerheide, but um, took that win at the Castile Cross in Zonebeke, as well as the day after the Belgian Championships, the, uh, the infamous cross after the Belgian Championships. And Otahem also took the victory there. Was on the podium at the Belgian Champs with third. I know she was going in for a potential win there earlier in the year took first place in Essen so not you know not all bad like she's had some she's had some rides that she can be uh, she can be happy with some wins at some smaller crosses but she's she definitely is when she's on good form and she's got a course that she likes Mary Nova Riberol uh, absolute force she is she picked her race as well with that exact cross series picking up those wins perhaps when some of the bigger names aren't there However, we haven't seen too much of her in these big series races, so it's great to see. It would be nice to get a time gap from this rider, Alvarado, back to her because I'm sure it's closing down. Another little slip from Alvarado there. Yeah, Alvarado, though, all things considered, riding a, a, a really good race here. Um, what do you have to say about Braun? Second at the Worlds, and how is Braun going to be looking back at her full season? She's taking quite a few victories this year, Ian. How for Lucinda Braun, 34 years old, former world champ, right, doing, you know, had an injury at the beginning of the year. What do you think about this rider? She's had a great season. She obviously came in late. She had that collarbone problem uh, crashing on the road. Uh, end of the summer. So she missed the start of the cross season, which is probably why she hasn't really taken to the start on these Super Prestige races too often. She's picked up four wins, um, second at the World Championships, and she's come really, really good. She had so many second places behind Fen Van Empel, obviously in these uh, races this season, but she can be very, very happy with her winter's work, and it looks like she's well on her way to another win today. Look at the speed she's now carrying through this section, completely different to that second lap where we saw her have that problem, just so much more aggressive on the pedals out of that corner and carries speed, feet up all the way through that section. So, like you said, just a very clever rider learning from one lap to the next and understanding that perhaps she needed to go a little bit easier before that section so that she could power on really hard through there and make up any time she lost from backing off elsewhere by riding that section clean. No, oh, yeah, like a, a clinic in cyclocross prowess. <laughs> you know, she's really done a good job on that to learn. But, you know, like I was saying earlier, the click and save, right? She's She realized that that section was uh, was something that was slowing her down. She, cho she chose to hold back and then change her lineup a little bit. As she gets the bell, that means one lap to go. This is the final lap of the race here for Lucinda Braun. Looking back at her stats, Ian, only off the podium two times a season. Once, fourth place in Havre, which is such one of the hardest crosses out there, and then fourth place in the super fast race down in Spain in Benidorm, probably during some training periods, one, but uh, only to be off the podium twice for the entire season. I would say that Braun is absolutely one of the top riders and one of the most dangerous on this uh, women's elite cyclocross circuit. Yeah, just ridiculous <laughs> to have that set of results in a season. Unfortunately for her, there is Fen Van Empel who obviously won so many races ahead of her, meaning that she was in second place a lot of the time with those podiums, but making the most of today with the absence of Fen Van Empel and looks like she is going to take out that win. Alvarado now. I don't know whether this section's got easier since we have those riders having all those problems earlier in the race or whether they're just learning with the technique and the power needed, perhaps the line. We saw the majority of people having problems going left through that section. See Alvarado this time all the way to the right as the riders look at it and carrying much better speed through that section. I'm sure she's going to be very, very pleased to hear the sound of that bell. Yeah. Absolutely, as now Braun off the machine here. You can see the fatigue setting in as she just kind of snarls her way up the top of this climb, just uh, pushing the bike as much as she can now. Laura Verdanschgott here sitting in second place. So it's Braun followed by Laura Verdanschgott, followed by Alvarado. And then we're going to see the fight for that uh, those other positions, four, five, and six, coming up just behind us. We know that Marriott Norbert Reberol is on the move here. That's the family of uh, Salen, Del Carmen, Alvarado there. Having seen them earlier in the year around the Christmas period, Ian, they come out in full force. A, a real family event for, the, uh, for Alvarado and her family to come out to these events. I love to see that. It certainly is, and for a lot of these riders, kind of 
dads, brothers, sisters, uh, mums, all part of it. They all come to the races, perhaps mechanic for these riders, take the jackets at the start, give them their recovery drinks at the end, etc. So, yeah, a big family event for an awful lot of these riders. One thing's to note, Alvarado down that start, finish straight for the final time, just up out the saddle and just doing that ever so painful kind of trying to stretch the lower back while you continue to pedal. So obviously just beginning to tighten up in these super tough conditions. Just wonder whether she can hold on to that third place now. Yeah, in the last lap of a race like this for Laura Verdonschgott, the rider we're looking at here, uh, what, is, uh, what is the tactic here? What will her pit crew be yelling to her? Obviously, you know, something along the lines of stay smooth, but what is what do you think is really vital for someone like Verdonschgott to be hearing from the pits right now? Stay focused, stay on it, um, stay pressing on those pedals without kind of making silly mistakes. You never know what can happen in cross. Uh, we saw at the World Championship, broken chains, broken derailleurs, um, broken wheels. So anything can happen, especially in these conditions. We spoke about kind of getting flicked left and right in these mud sections thrown into the barriers perhaps, uh, break a lever on the bike. So anything can happen. So she needs to stay on it just in case this rider, Lucinda Brand, does have a problem. But at the same time, she might have a problem herself. So she needs that buffer over third place. She has ridden a brilliant race up to this point. She deserves this podium today. So just needs to stay smooth, stay on it, and not make any stupid errors on this final lap. Yeah, yeah you can get a big, a big glob of mud or sand on your cassette and then that can just take you right out of the race so i think like you said you know be more gingerly in some of these sections really focus on this one this is a big result for laura veronica i mean this is a this is one of the big like you said televised cross right she's got a really good opportunity here to stand up on the podium against two you know former world champs in alvarado and in Braun, as we see the sixth place rider mary norbert reverol now so right now your top six as i know it Braun, veronica alvarado bent veld versed in mary norbert reverol there so that's about as much as i got we believe uh just behind her anique van alpha but haven't confirmed that yet as i don't have the live timing so everything to play for this one but still probably another seven minutes for this rider here to be able to finish this one out for lucien lebron as the the public the crowd there really cheers on this uh the, the dutch champ today i love the belgian crowd I'll do a kind of polite clap to the leader on the final lap almost congratulating them on the win already obviously uh, still kind of around about half a lap to go for lucinda brand but acknowledging what they've seen today and just a very polite applause as the riders make their way round on this final lap talking of the scott her best result so far in the super prestige series this year is a 10th place in Overizer, so a huge step forward within this series. To be up here in second place behind a rider like Brand just goes to show how far she's come this season. Yeah, former winners of this race. Our good friend Helen Wyman won this race in 2014, and it's, I'm sure it's come a long way in, uh, in how the women are uh, looked after uh, at this since, uh, since Helen won this, but it's really cool to see. Then Sana Kant taking it in 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. Then it was uh, 2019 was scratched for Denise Betsema after uh, a uh, contaminated supplement was uh, a positive test for her. Alvarado taking it in 2020. Betsema again in 2021. 2022 was canceled for the pandemic. And then 2023 last year, Alvarado took the win on this one. But definitely over the last 12 editions of this, it's very cool to see such packed crowds up here at the North Sea Cross Ian. It really is. And this woman deserves all the applause that she's had today. A brilliant ride, second place, like we say. Last year's podium, Alvarado Brand worst. So uh, Don got not even on the podium last year. She's had a third here in the past, but uh, she's going one better today. Braun super focused as she comes through, trying to round out and just put the cherry on top of her season. She's got the, she definitely got the ice cream, she's got the whipped cream, and she's just trying to put just the last finishing touches on this one because she's had such a good year. Sven Nace, the, the manager of the Balawaza Trek Lions team, going to be really happy with Braun, although, you know, he had some riders had injuries and problems. He's got to be really happy with the way that the season's gone for, the, for that program. They've had a great year. They've been at the front of just about every event that they've showed up to this year. They have, and I think probably one of the teams that performed above and beyond with some of the younger talent on the men's side coming through. Obviously, Sharon Van Anroy didn't have the season that she would have wanted on the women's side, but Brand has really, really stepped up. She made the move to a different uh, location to live, uh, better training facilities for the cyclocross, and 
you can see that come to the fore. She, her skills have really, really improved since she joined that team, since she started working with Sven Nace, just learning, adapting. And I think that's a sign of a great champion kind of taking on board. Even though she was already very, very good, she was still willing to learn, willing to get better and wanted to get better. And that's kind of what we're seeing this season from her. Yeah, she is a big champion in this sport. I love to see all the fans out there, just like you said, giving them a little bit of a golf clap here. Looks to me, Ian, as though the course drying out a little bit. Certainly, it looks a lot less kind of slippy compared to those early laps, just riding this section a little bit easier. So perhaps some sections getting a little bit easier, but as those thick, deep mud sections dry out, they'll go get a lot harder, more power needed to get through those as through the pits for the final time for Lucinda Brand. Ron, with a little bit of a tongue out there, I think she uh, she's just showing her mechanics that she's really happy with this one, just giving them a little bit of, uh, you know, a little inflection. She knows that the, uh, the, the the killer instinct that she has, she can let down her guard a little bit as she goes through there. She knows she's kind of safe, even with a small error there. She's got enough of a buffer that she should be, uh, she should be in good shape, although never say never, as you see there from... Um, from Verdun Scott Ian, just trying to pop that rear wheel into that rut to carry her around that 180 turn into the sand. Keep that front wheel wide of that rut, and then, like you say, use that rut to turn the rear wheel nice and tight to hit that next uh, rut through the sand. So you see Brand onto this very final tricky section for her. Verdun Scott remounts. Takes a little bit of extra care to try and get back in those pot, uh, pedals before the drop to be able to ride this next section, this next section of tricky course on this middle Kirka course. But Brand coming now round. She'll be on to that start finish straight for the very final time very shortly. Well, it is the Dutch champion Lucinda Brand today here in this uh, Telenet Super Prestige Series that's been able to put away all of the biggest competition in the game. Big smile here from the Dutch champion to take another victory this year. It's Lucinda Brand winning this edition of the Telenet Super Prestige Series here in Middlekerke today. Not quite flag to flag, but pretty damn close from Brand and mm. just never looked in trouble, rode her own pace. Didn't see too many mistakes from her. She did come to a halt at one point early on on that second lap on that kind of, I want to call it like big whoop section. Um, we saw her have a problem, but she learned from that and then never looked in doubt from that point on. Anna Marie versus Mom there, giving uh, congratulations to uh, to Brand. What were we seeing there from uh, Verdanschkat? She looked as though she was waiting a little bit, Ian, in that corner there. I don't know exactly what I saw there, but she looked to be just kind of waiting a bit or just uh, taking a little, little more time to get herself into the pedals there. Uh, Maybe I a cramp. Think was, I think that was potentially the lapped rider from the same team just ah. getting out of the way of Verdanschkat. So a little confusing there. Uh, one of those Thank riders. you for that. Obviously had a mechanical, and so uh, there she is, the ah. lapped rider. So she was just making sure she was getting out of the way. Thank you for that. Well, <laughs> not nothing to take away from Verdun Schott, as She now is going to be coming up to the finish line. She's going to be ecstatic with this one after the end of the season that she's had. Laura Verdun Schott puts away another podium at the end of this year, fresh off of the momentum from her victory in Maldehem. The Belgian rider comes away with second spot. And what, Ian, can we say about this third spot? The overall title took the overall in the World Cup this year. What a consistent season here for Alvarado all year long to be able to knock this one out, take third place, and really put a final touch in a, on this one for Alvarado. What a huge battler, just fighting all the way to the end of that one and thoroughly deserved winner of the Super Prestige Series. Looks to be Marriott Norbert Riverol here coming in to finish this one off. Really strong ride from the from the uh, from the Belgian rider. It's a good ride here for fourth spot for uh, for Marion Norbert Riverol there. Two minutes down, which tells us just how hard this course was. It certainly was. She came super strong in those closing last two laps in particular, carrying really good speed through some of the sections that we saw her on. Here comes Anna Marie Verst. 
in for fifth place. Couldn't quite overhaul that six point gap to Alvarado for the overall, sorry, fifth place for her on the day, unable to overhaul that points deficit on the day. But second place overall in the Super SD series for her, not a bad day out. No, we lost track of uh, a little bit of um, how Mary Norbert Reroll was going through. I think uh, for me, I, I thought she was back in six, but she was clearly on a better, much better tear. I think we just missed a shot of her, but that's uh, that's all good. So she ends up with fourth and then first and fifth and Bentveld in sixth place. And this is Anique Van Alpha, the rider from the 777 Reds, doing a, a good job here. I think that that's a, it's a very respectable ride as we see uh, Anna Marie there with her mom. Um, just, you know, riding, finishing this one out. It's been a long season if you think back to the first races, uh, the first World Cup anyways, um, and even before that in September, yet. it's a long season for these cross riders with a lot of travel. It really is, and you see kind of that build up of mental and physical fatigue at the end of the season, topped off with a really, really hard race today for these riders. Very, very tough conditions on what's already a tough course as Van Alphen comes in, stretches out that lower back. Very tough for these riders, and I'm sure they'll all be saying the same thing in their interviews afterwards, how difficult the conditions were. A Coke after the race, nothing like it. Ah, man, you love going that hard and getting a Coke. But here it was, Ian, Lucien Lebron taking this one out. Just perfect race almost. Just a, a few slips here and there, but recovered really, really well from them. And once she hit the front, there was just no looking back for her. Perfect setup with the bike today, as we see Alicia Frank coming up to the line. Eighth place for her today. Yeah. Another rider that we've seen win some of the smaller crosses, like the exact cross and some of these over the years. She's been a rider that's continued to uh, become quite the force on the Belgian scene. But I, I think Verdomschgott is, uh, is, is really going to be vying and considering and thinking about that elusive Belgian championship here. Trying to take that off the shoulders of this rider, Sonicamp. But man, is, I don't think there's anyone, period, male or female, that's still racing that has the experience of that rider right there, Ian. Certainly not unbelievable record at the Belgian Championships. I think she has already announced that she won't participate in the championships next year because she will be retiring and so not competing in the season after. And so it's already said that she doesn't think it's fair to go for that win next season and not wear the, wear the tricolour the following season. So class right until the end from Santa Can. Yeah, unbelievable. It'll be hard, I think, for everyone to see. She'll mark the end of a huge generation of riders and uh, evolution in the sport. I mean, we were talking about Helen earlier and all that she did, but, man, Sonicant as well done so much for the sport on the women's side. Sonicant there coming in. This rider number 15, Judith Kral there, riding uh, riding really, really strong today to finish this one out. She's happy with 11th spot. That was a good ride. It was. We've seen some uh, good performances from her since that Christmas period. Really good. Always good when you're in around the top 10. See very muddy high fives for those spectators. And probably some of them regretting going for that high five once they realized how muddy that right hand from Lucinda Brand constantly grabbing that down tube, placing the bike on the shoulder. But what more I expect to say that about we'll be this woman? Nothing. I mean, everything good. There's lots of mud there. Uh, definitely be looking forward to that shower afterward. But um, yeah, we'll be hearing from her, and I, I expect nothing but uh, but smiles and a lot of positivity coming out of Braun in her uh, post-race interview. We'll do our best to give you a quick translation of that as uh, Ian and I put together our, our Flemish uh, for the day, our Flemish lesson. <laughs> Yeah, looking forward to that. So if you're joining us for this women's race, don't forget the men's race kicking off in about 30 minutes uh, right here, uh, depending on where you're watching, Eurosport player, wherever. Here we go with Lucinda Brown. Is that na vandaag? Misschien toch al een beetje anders? Ja, ja, nee, het is heel mooi om nog weer een overwinning mee te pakken dit seizoen. Hoe zwaar was het eigenlijk? 
Ja, het was heel zwaar. Het, uh, het was echt gewoon uh, alleen een heel traag stoemtempo. Nergens uh, een echte diepe versnelling kon natuurlijk ook wel, omdat ik alleen de hele tijd één steady tempo rijden. Maar daar was ik ook heel blij mee, want veel meer dan dat was er niet in. Heb jij dan meteen gekozen voor een eigen tempo? Of was het ook toen je zag dat Alvarado daar plots wegviel, dat je dacht, oké, okay, nu trek ik toch even door? Uh, nou ja, ik zag inderdaad die slipper maken. Dus ik twijfelde dan natuurlijk niet om uh, gewoon mijn eigen tempo te blijven doen. En uh, het is fijn als je inderdaad de ruimte hebt en uh, niet uh, in iemand zijn uh, wiel zit op dit rondje. En de conclusie is, de benen die blijven nog altijd heel goed. Dat wordt nog een mooi seizoenseinde voor je. Uh, ja, inderdaad. De power zit er nog goed in. En uh, nou ja, dan, uh, deze zit er in ieder geval mooi uh, bij de erelijst. En uh, wie weet wat er nog komt. Gefeliciteerd, dankjewel. Just saying how difficult the race was. Uh, had really good legs, rode her own tempo. So once Alvarado had that slip, she uh, just rode her own tempo, and that was enough on the day to to take out the win. Very very happy to to take another win this season, which has already been really really good for her. So uh, yeah, like we expected, happy day yeah. for uh, Lucinda Brand. Yeah, just riding super strong all day and feeling like she had a good rhythm there. And like you said, yeah, just taking, capitalizing on that slip early on and not really looking back. So, Brond really putting this one together. Super, super strong ride for her. Well, this was the start of Middlekirka. Things got off to a furiously fast pace with Bedveld, Alvarado, Verdun Scott, all of the big names out on the start, Ian, and it came off this one to some really sloppy and nasty conditions, and Alvarado going down right in that first turn. Exactly, got a really good start, but then went down very, very early. We saw problems for a number of different riders on this opening lap, but that was the key moment in terms of the overall win today, and Brand was off, riding her own tempo, riding her own lines, and we saw this section of the course very, very tricky. Took a while for a lot of the riders to get to grips with it in more ways than one, and Anna Marie just came to a complete halt there, and that was the race for the overall pretty much done. Anna Marie verse just fell back from that point on really but there was no one getting any closer to this woman Lucinda Brand today just brilliant no Braun continued to just ride section after section super cleanly but it was that rider there the Belgian rider Laura Verdanschkot the real sensation of the end of this year she's ridden a great year but she started to come through this is where she made the pass on Alvarado to put herself very securely into second spot and then Alvarado doing everything that she could to just keep her in her sights but small bobbles like this were the name of the game today it was about trying to overcome those issues it was also this Belgian rider Marriott Norbert reroll that made a real tear through those two riders there Anna Marie Verst and Leonie Bentveld to come into fourth spot to be able to take that fourth place overall in this race but uh, it was this rider Ian Lucinda Braun that put it all together today just unstoppable and looked amazing from the off. Donchkot came through really well. Would have been interesting to see whether she could have gone with Brand a little bit longer if she'd been in the wheel on that opening lap. But Alvarado dug really, really deep for that final podium place and securing that super prestige win overall. Laura Donchkot, you gaat van de hoogtepunt naar hoogtepunt dit seizoen. Deze mogen we er ook weer hoog bij schrijven, zeker. Ja, sowieso. De ambitie was om nog in een klasse menscross een podium te rijden en dat is hier vandaag gelukt. Ik hoop dat ik morgen uh, nog betere benen heb of, of toch zeker goed hersteld ga van deze wedstrijd. Ik denk dat dat belangrijk is. En, uh, ja, ik, ik, ik aas op een eend van de X2 morgen voor de kindjes van mijn zus, dus ik hoop dat dat er nog in zit morgen. Morgen is het in Lille, daar ben je extra gemotiveerd voor. Ja, klopt. Het is een thuiscross. Um, 
veel volk. Uh, maar als je op deze manier rondrijdt, dan, dan supportert iedereen wel voor u. Uh, ik heb het al anders geweten, dus dat is wel fijn, ja. Goed, nog eerst even focussen op vandaag natuurlijk. In de eerste ronde leek het een beetje alsof je niet helemaal top was. En dan begon jij plots iedereen op te rapen. Vertel eens, hoe ging dat? Ja, vaak is de eerste ronde altijd wel een beetje een probleem met mij. Maar uh, ik had een goede start en op de eerste bocht mischakelde ik mijn eigen. En reed ik mijn eigen redelijk vast. En dan, ja, dan komen ze allemaal langs achter en dan had ik zoiets van passeer. Maar ik zie wel waar ik uitkom en niet over mijn toer. En dan ja, kom ik in mijn ritme en dan zei ik wel dat de anderen terugvalden. En dan ja, zat ik al redelijk snel in de tweede positie. Maar heb je al eens gekeken ook naar de namen die je hier vandaag achterlaat? Maldegem was overwinning, super mooi natuurlijk. Maar de namen hier, dat is misschien ook nog wel van een ander kaliber. Ja, sowieso. Ik denk dat dit hoger aangeprezen staat. Ik denk, uh, als je langs uh, Lucine en Belverado op podium mocht staan, dat echt wel een plaatje is om, uh, om in te kaderen. En daar ben ik trots op, ja. Het vertrouwen moet groot zijn. Maar hoe belangrijk is dat mentale dan ook voor jou? Dat het daar nu ook helemaal goed zit? Ja, superbelangrijk. Ik denk dat dat het belangrijkste is in een carrière van een topsporter. Als ik hier mee een niet-mentale gezondheid aan de start komt staan, ga ik hier ook niet presteren. En, uh, ja, het is fijn, ik kom hier met een goed gevoel. Ik maak me ook geen zorgen, dus uh, ja, dat, is, dat is leuker om dan cross af te zakken. Dankjewel en veel succes met de jacht op dat eentje morgen ook. Very happy with, with the podium today. She said these classification races that she does, she's always looking to podium. And so really good to be on the podium with riders like Brand, Alvarado. Um, got questioned whether this is a different caliber of race compared to Maldegem on Wednesday where she took out that win and she tended to agree the big names are here and she's up there duking it out taking that second place today uh, she goes again tomorrow in the X2O trophy at Lilla so looking forward to that one yeah looks as though she's maybe even considering that overall classement there a little bit more just because she's in fifth spot overall currently in the x2o trophy again tomorrow in Lilla, and um maybe thinking about what could be possible there as she goes up against on reverse denise betsema brand uh without van empel there although van empel's already uh secured that overall title uh she can't be beaten in that series um she definitely is uh she definitely is going to be up against some and she maybe even could move up a spot or two i, I think it'd be tough but there's a chance Yeah, Lilla, traditionally a really, really fast, sandy race. However, uh, we've seen what this woman can do in sand. And traditionally, you wouldn't have huge gaps. But you never know tomorrow, as we hear from Alvarado. Let's begin with the most positive of today. You're the end winner of the Super Prestige, your second regelmatigheid criterium, that you this season win. That is toch fantastic. Ja, daar ben ik zeker blij mee. Ik ben blij dat, uh, dat het vandaag toch is gelukt om uh, mijn leidersplaats te behouden en dat ik uiteindelijk uh, eindwinnares ben. Voor de dagzegen ben je niet in aanmerking gekomen. Het ging al vrij vroeg mis. Wat gebeurde daar precies? Ja, uh, ik gleed onderuit. Uh, ik stond er zelf van, uh, van te kijken. Ik kwam een beetje uit de lucht. Maar uh, ja, ik pakte me wel. Maar Lucinda die reed zo hard in de eerste ronde dat het gewoon niet lukte. En uh, ja, mijn rug. Uh, ik heb ja, de hele wedstrijd gewoon last van mijn rug gehad. Dus het was voor mij ook echt uh, gewoon mijn eigen tempo proberen rijden. En uiteindelijk uh, heeft dat nog net gerusteerd in een derde plaats. Want Marion kwam, die kwam ook wel aardig dicht. Die rug speelt dus opnieuw op. Heeft dat dan nog veel zin om nog wedstrijden te blijven rijden met die rug? Nu je ja, eigenlijk alles wat je kon winnen qua klassementen bijvoorbeeld gewonnen hebt, verdedigd hebt? Nee, nee inderdaad. Ja, zo rondrijden is niet leuk. En uh, dat is ook uh, zeker geen pleziertje. Niet uh, fysiek, maar ook mentaal niet. En uh, ja, we hebben er dan samen met de ploeg voor uh, besloten dat dit ook mijn laatste wedstrijd is. Dus uh, je houdt het voor mij op. En uh, ik denk dat mijn rug daar wel heel erg, uh, heel erg blij mee is. En uiteindelijk, ik heb twee klassementen gewonnen en uh, uiteindelijk toch wel een mooi seizoen gedraaid. Dus ik kan het wel uh, met positief zin afsluiten. Maar voor alle duidelijkheid is wel noodgedwongen door die rugproblemen, anders ja, ging je nog wel door. Ja, normaal ging ik tot het einde doorrijden, maar uh, met mijn rug ging dat niet gaan. Dus uh, uiteindelijk hebben we besloten om uh, het hierbij te laten. Dat snap ik. Herstel goed en uh, gefeliciteerd met het mooie seizoen sowieso. Dankjewel. Ja, right. Alvarado just really pleased to take out her second classification of the season. And if it wasn't for those back problems that she would continue with the races left this season, but Obviously, she's happy to end her season here. As she said, two classifications. It's It's been a very, very good season for Alvarado. Sure has. Yeah, she really never was focused on the X2O trophy. You know, uh, ninth overall in that one. So she's uh, definitely done a good job to focus on the World Cup in this. Said her back did affect her today, so uh, I think she's fairly happy to be able to 
call it the end of the season. It's, it's never nice having to ride through kind of injuries when there's classifications on the line. You saw kind of the grimace from her towards the end of the race. But what a performance from this woman. Yeah, then we have Alvarado there with Braun, and of course Verdanskot can't be too far away. So everybody there just to finish this one off, and it's going to be a big, big celebration I think for everybody, especially for Alvarado here with this overall title. A great year if you can take the World Cup overall, uh, <laughs> take quite a few. Uh, Big races in the process, and uh, really put up a fight against the new, the new generation that's coming. Fembenempel, Puck, Peterse, Braun, you know, Alvarado. Really, after last year, she really put herself in the position to uh, to be one of the riders that everybody fears when she starts in the start line. I think, you know, you you, um, you as a rider, you have to evolve and change your goals. Alvarado has done so much at such a young age. The only thing really missing from her Palmares this was uh, that World Cup overall title. She took it. I think she's won every class. Class, uh, classification that there is now in this sport. The World Cup, Super Prestige, X2O, including the World Championship title. Um, gosh, at such a young age, Ian, what a, what a rider Alvarado is. She has literally won it all. And I think for most riders, if they won a World Cup series or a Super Prestige series in their career, then it would be made, <laughs> let alone to win both in one season. Um, it's just phenomenal. Scott here coming up on second on the podium. The Belgian fans will be ecstatic about this, having a Belgian up on the podium. The, the sport most recently, Ian, and really dominated by the Dutch women. Definitely. It's nice to see uh, another nationality up on that podium because, like you say, it's been an awful long time for uh, Dutch-dominated podiums at the elite end of the women's sport. But another Dutch woman takes the win, Lucinda Brand for the Balawas Trek team. One of the oldest crosses, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the oldest cross outside of maybe the World Championships and the Belgian Championships. This is the oldest cyclocross race on the circuit, the women's race. Uh, I believe this to be its 12th edition, starting off in 2014. So pretty prestigious race here, and you can see that the the uh, all the fans they don't miss this one. This is uh, you know as the races get older and older, Ian, more and more people get nostalgic and they keep coming out, and you can hear them chanting for the champions today out there in Middelkirke. Yeah, all these riders want to add their name to the prestigious list of previous winners, as we as we read out earlier, some top top names already. They're going to get ready to do their podium selfie. Looks like Lucinda Brand's one. Lovely set of leaks. <laughs> we don't know whose vote it is, but we know we need to give it back to someone. <laughs> So, our overall top 10 here, Lucien Nebron, Laura Verdanschkat, Salen Del Carmen Alvarado, Ribarolo, Verst, Bentfeld, Van Alpha, Frank, Kant, and Julie Browers. Rounds out your top 10 today here in Middle Kirka. And your overall, it's Salen Del Carmen Alvarado taking the overall, overall, overall with 100 points, Verst with 92, Van Alpha with 81, Van der Heiden with 74, 67 for Sana Kant. So, big day out. Dus dat kunnen we daar niet doorgaan. Op het derde plaats 
Well, that is going to wrap this one up here for this final round of the Super Prestige here in Middle Kirka. Thank you very much to my co-host Ian Field for all of his uh, for all of his insights today. If you're Sticking around, come find us in about 10 minutes for the elite men's race here. But that is going to do it for us here in Middle Kirka. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jeremy Powers from Ian Field. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. All right, they tricked us, guys. It's not the end. We're going to be going through this final here just to see, uh, just this finish up with the Super Prestige here. We've got Inga van der Heide. We've got Anna Marie Verst there in second, and then today's overall winner, Salen del Carmen Alvarado. Yeah, I think Van Alphen overhauled Inga van der Heide because she didn't take to the start today. So uh, that was the one that was close for the overall, that third position. So uh, Van Alphen moves into third, takes out that 10,000 euro prize pot. And the winner on the day, Alvarado, third in the race, but maintained that lead in the overall. 25,000 euros will be entering her bank account shortly. <laughs> you can't go to the bank with that check, but they'll certainly be giving her another one. Ian, you're a coach. What do you say to someone like Anik Van Alphen for staying in this one and for riding super strongly? Ah. The Belgian fans never, never with a dull moment here. Ian, what would you be saying to someone like Anik Van Alpha taking this one out, riding in herself into third overall on this one? Just a huge pat on the back, really. Just the tenaciousness to yeah continue this deep into the season on a high level, stay motivated. And she's been rewarded by uh, turning up today and taking out that third overall. Haven't heard why Inga van der Aden didn't take to the start today. Uh, a virus. She's virus. Well, yes, that she's got everything. a virus. And yeah, you can't she's going to be wrapping up race. her season. Yeah, yeah. She's been feeling, she did a good ride at the Worlds, but she says that she has some type of virus that's lingering and she's going to be ending her season early. So another rider, it's uh, Alvarado, going to be stopping after this just to rehab her back fully. Inger van der Heide finishing this one out completely. So that is going to do it here for us today in Middle Kirka. Thank you very much for a second time for joining us. Come find us over on the men's side in just 10 minutes for the elite men's race here. From Jeremy Powers and Ian Field, thank you very much. Bye for now.
We wachten dus op het zijn van de jury om straks de renners te laten verzamelen voor een appel. En dan gaan we over tot dat appel van de laatste wedstrijd van vandaag hier. En ook de laatste in het Super Prestige. Hier in de Noordzee Cross in de 64e editie al van deze Noordzee Cross. Deze editie 59 dus. Door Mijnbach. Ja, dat Ladies and gentlemen, cyclocross fans and viewers from all around the globe, welcome to today's coverage of the eighth and final stop of the Telenet Super Prestige Series. Today's race being held in Middelkirke, Belgium, in an event known as the North Sea Cross, tucked right up along the Belgian coastline in the most northwest corner of Belgium in West Flanders. This event running its first edition February 7th, 1959, making it one of the oldest existing crosses on the circuit. I'm Jeremy Powers, and I'm joined today by friend, former competitor, one of the best co-commentators in the game, five-time British national champ, Ian Field. Ian, welcome. Hey, Jeremy. Really looking forward to this one today. If you haven't already watched it, go back, watch the women's race. It's given us a little kind of appetizer for the men's race now. Some proper mud conditions for these competitors. Uh, looking forward to seeing how the men handle this course. Very, very tricky in places. 
all about carrying momentum, carrying your speed. So, uh, yeah, already seeing some people <laughs> stuck in the mud. Well, that's not something you want on a Sunday. You don't, definitely don't want to be stuck in the mud. But we saw the weather conditions, about 48 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're joining us on Max, so you're in the North America and you're using Fahrenheit, about 48 degrees, about 9 degrees Celsius if you're in the rest of the world. Ian, lots of rain over the last couple of days here in this part of Belgium. It basically hasn't stopped raining for the last two to three days, really. Um, and it's made the course very, very tricky in places. It is drying as the day goes on, so some of the muddy sections becoming harder and harder to ride, and, but, but some sections are becoming a little easier. We saw very slippery early on, but in fact uh, kind of dried up as the women's race went on. It got a little easier in places, as we hear from Elliot. Ik zei als ik een Belgische titel haalde, dat ik uh, een keer iets, iets anders wilde doen. En uh, ik heb eigenlijk een goede partner daarin gevonden in de AE-cars. Uh, het is nu al de vierde keer dat ik iets anders meekrijg van de auto. Vandaag is de Ferrari. Dus uh, ja, ik vond het moraal hoog te houden. Hebben ze het wel iets goed gevonden. Dus uh, het heeft wel extra motivatie. Dat is inderdaad de moeite. Geeft tien zegenspakken dit seizoen ook extra motivatie? Ja, dat wel. En eigenlijk elf ook. Want als ik er elf neem, wordt het mijn vijftigste profoverwinning. Dus uh, daar ben ik wel stiekem mee bezig. Dus tien is heel mooi, maar elf zou nog mooier zijn. Uh, ik hoop er vandaag aan te beginnen, maar het is wel echt een super lastig rondje. Uh, lastiger dan ik verwacht had. Hoe voelen de benen nog aan? Um, deze week eigenlijk verrassend goed. Um, je levert natuurlijk wel naar zo'n WK toe. En dan is er wel echt die decompressie na de tijd van... Um, het is niet dat ik moeite had om me op te laden, maar wel dat je dan um, echt zo merkt van oké, okay, je, je leeft zo naar dat WK toe nog. En dan daarna is het wel uh, een beetje de druk eraf, dat merkte ik wel. Maar ik voelde me eigenlijk best wel goed deze week verder nog. Uh, de benen waren gewoon goed. Uh, ik heb lekker gefietst. De, ja, wat ik al zei, de, de druk is eraf. Ik uh, keek echt nog wel uit naar deze wedstrijd vandaag. Uh, omdat ik nog wel die tweede plek gewoon wil bouwen. Um, en hopelijk uh, een mooie uitslag nog te rijden. Dus het is eigenlijk een beetje bonus. Het is wel een parcours dat heel zwaar is en waarin de andere renners jou automatisch naar voren schuiven. Hoe vind je het uh, rondje erbij liggen? Um, ja, het ligt me echt wel goed, merk ik zelf ook wel. Het is technisch, maar wel gewoon zwaar genoeg. Um, het zou me normaal echt wel moeten liggen, dus uh, ja, ik ben benieuwd. Lars van der Haar, je staat hier vol modder. De fiets ook volledig besmeurd. Dat verraadt alles zeker over hoe het parcours erbij ligt? Ja, ik kon ze niet eens een keer uh, die regenkraan dichtdraaien, want... Pff. Het is echt, echt wel heel zwaar parcours. Dat is België zeker dan? Nee, het heeft niks met België te maken. Hè. Dat is gewoon de regen overal op dit moment. Maar uh, nou, het is gelukkig nog wel heel veel fietsbaar. Alleen ja, het ligt er gewoon heel zwaar bij. Het is echt wel duur. Michael van Toerenhout, hoe lang gaat jouw witte trui vandaag wit blijven? Um, ja, 170 meter denk ik. Dus uh, nu nee, het is wel heel zwaar. Maar goed, ik heb het wel liever uh, zo dan, uh, dan echt die snelheidscrossen. Dus uh, ja, uh, ik heb het zo wel graag gehad. Jij wordt hier wel enthousiast van, want de meningen zijn uh, soms verdeeld over dit soort parcours. Hè? Ja, natuurlijk na 2K zou ik ook wel liever uh, proper blijven en een mooie snelle cross. Maar uh, voor mij is beter zoiets dan, uh, uh, ja, dan kan ik wel ergens uh, een verschil maken. Dat, dat heb ik wel liever. Ja. Dat is een ding bij jullie. Eli heeft net zijn bril ook laten vallen. <laughs> toevallig. Um, je hebt een geweldig WK erop zitten. De vorm lijkt ook uh, heel goed. Profiteer je ergens van het feit dat je ja, ziektes en zo gehad hebt, dat je nu misschien iets beter bent dan de anderen? Um, ja, misschien wel. Uh, ik heb misschien mijn deel van, uh, van de ziektes en zo al gehad. Dus uh, hopelijk kan ik nu nog een tweetal uh, weken uh, daarvan uh, gespaard blijven. Um, dus ja, het, 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 het klopt wel goed. Uh, Mal hem was, uh, was goed, maar niet, niet voor te zeggen uh, dat, dat ik superbenen had. Dus uh, ja, we zien vandaag hoe dat, uh, hoe dat vandaag is. Uh, vandaag heb je wel goede benen nodig om mee te doen. Ja. Heel veel succes. Well, Ian, what do you think of all that? The main takeaway is the rider is just saying how hard the course is, how hard the conditions are. It's very technical in places, as we've already seen. Lots of these bankings, very tricky to ride up, but also ride down. And that's kind of the main features of this middle Kirka course, these, these bankings that the riders have to go up, traverse across and back down, kind of one after another, all about carrying momentum, carrying the speed getting off before you have to and I'm sure we're going to see uh, that man at the head of the race today coming off a win on Wednesday in Maldegum perhaps a, a slightly smaller race 
However, we're back to the classification races this weekend, in the final round of the Super Prestige Series. Lawrence Schweek looking for that first win of the season. Yeah, he sort of bit. Whoa, big changes there for this for uh, for us to see that tire on the start line. That'll be maybe uh, we'll definitely look to see what else we see. But a traditional tire there for Lauren Sweck. He sort of bit rolling up in a uh, Ferrari though. That's also something uh, we don't see. We see Vanderpool coming in in a Lamborghini with a sponsorship, but uh, he sort of bit deciding to show up to today's race in a Ferrari. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, didn't want to be outdone by Van der Poel. We've seen some uh, amazing cars on offer roll up with uh, Van der Poel in so far this season. So didn't want to be outdone. Classic red Ferrari for Isabit this morning. Very, very much stand out like a sore thumb in uh, Belgium on the rainy day to take out your Ferrari. But yeah, that's how you feel good when you get to the start line. Here he is, Ely Isabit world number one on the start line 26 year old from Castor, belgium ready to uh ready to rock today and try to hold down the overall in this series vanderhaar last year's overall winner here got second place to easter bit at this race last year vanderhaar ready to do damage and the big dog from belgium this is niels van de puto riding for the alpes and de kunik team really good uh had a good podium spot at the uh race earlier this week in malvahem Van, uh, Van de Puta going to be looking to put this one together today and end his season on a high. For sure. He looked really good on Wednesday, really good in that leading group. And, yeah, he'll be hoping for more again today. He's already had one Super Prestige podium this season, 13th at the World Championship. So shows he's in good form. But like you noted, Lawrence Schweek with the uh, Typhoon tread from the Dugast. Everyone else seems to be on a mud tread. Maybe he's just trying to gamble ever so slightly, get his season back on track. But he mentioned the other day, no wins this season. I went back through his history. He has never had a winless season since records began in 2009 when he was a junior. So, uh, yeah, he's going to want to put things right in these final few races of this season. Yeah, definitely interesting. Perhaps maybe even just for the first lap, he'll be choosing to run that Typhoon just to get to, just to get out in front. I mean, you could make a case for it if you were thinking, okay, yeah, at the start line, I can just run a little bit faster off the out of the blocks to be able to do that. But uh, the riders are definitely starting to feel that adrenaline as they get ready for this one. They certainly are. The nerves building. Did see some of the women. Julie Browers was uh, running the Griffo Typhoon tread. So. Not completely out of the question. It'll be interesting to see how it works out for Lauren Schweek once this race is underway. The riders hearing about 30 seconds to go as they sit down here, getting ready to look this one right in the face. The final race of the Super Prestige series here as we see the big focus from Vanderhaar and Niels van der Putte. Waiting for the lights to turn green. And they are off. Here we go, the eighth round of the Telenet Super Prestige Series here in Middlekirken. It looks to be Niels van der Putte on the right-hand side taking this one out as he points his way down to this big turn here right as they get the Alpes and de Kunik rider off. No problems, Ian, for any of these riders off the start as they make this big right-hand turn into this big, deep, heavy mud section. So important to get a good start because you literally turn off the road straight into this deep, heavy going. Almost the riders coming to a dead stop there, but Ellie is a bit really good start from here. Van der Putter, Joris Neuenhaus coming around the outside. Orts there as well. Stan Godry, he's announced his retirement from the sport of sight across the end of this season. So he's had a really good start making the most of these final few races. Yeah. Definitely really good, as you can see some of the conditions. If you're just joining us, lots of nasty conditions. Oh, a little bit of a uh, little bit of a problem here for these two riders here. Michael Van Tornhout getting into a little bit of a, a verbal uh, altercation there with Ryan Camp. So we'll definitely be hearing about that after the race. Not something we see. A lot of respect between riders, but today something going on between those two. As we see Easterbit at the front, Niels Van der Putte followed by a newly minted uh, champ jersey there for uh, Joris Neuvenhaus, Ian. I think that's leftovers from uh, Wednesday. We saw Michael Van Turnout and Ryan Camp really going at each other. Whether we see now Michael Van Turnout looks like he grabbed Ryan Camp's bike and pulled him back, and Camp just stops and wants to have it out with him on the course. But 
That's hindered quite a lot of other riders. Pim Ronha caught up behind that one as well. I don't see that every day in the cyclocross. All right, well, neither here nor there. Those two will have to figure that out after the race. There's always, a, you know, keep us on the edge of our seats with a little bit of drama. But here we go. It uh, looks to be Wishura there coming up for uh, the Clareland uh, Freestads team there, doing everything that he can to stay in there. Vanderhaar with a little bit of a start. He's a little bit uh, off the back there, maybe held up by that little altercation there between those. But Orts right now, it's Iservid, uh, Vandeputa right there, followed by Joris Neuvenhaus and Orts all up in that top four. Really good start for Orts. It certainly is one of the best. See, Isabit went down while leading just one of these very, very small bankings that we've got all the way around this course. Caught Isabit out there, but already the riders on and off their bikes almost constantly on this opening part of the lap through the pits for the first time. And it's Neuenhaus coming to the front now, laying down that power that saw him take out second place at the World Championships right now into the pits already but there's Jens Adams there on the right hand side of your screen just coming through there it is the spike change there for uh, for a lot on sway coming in Michael Van Torn out also in the pits there as well getting a new machine that gamble on the tires really didn't play off for so it looked like he just didn't get clipped in as quite as quite as fast as others off the line and has fallen way back and went in for that bike change. Be interested to see whether he did change back onto that mud tread. But a lot of riders caught out in the opening quarter of a lap. But two of the strongest riders that we had noted down already at the front, Neuenhaus and Isabit. Yeah, yours, Neuenhaus, second at the World Championships behind Mathieu Vanderpool. Just, uh, just seven days ago, um, securing, looking to secure second place overall in this series. He did miss a race in this one earlier on, which is what's hampered his overall. Right behind him, Ely Easterbit, fifth at the World Championships, won that uh, exact cross race on Wednesday in Maldahem. Hasn't been off a podium, Ian, yet in the Super Prestige Series this year. So Easterbit definitely looking to wrap this one up and finish off uh, a really good uh, Super Prestige Series overall. Interesting the van to put up and a few others managing oh, problems <laughs> for Mewson through that section, but shows how difficult it is riders not carrying much speed at all into that first plank, but some of the riders still able to ride. Pim Ronhar with a surprisingly bad start here in this opening one. Uh, what's that all about, Ian? I think he was one of the riders caught up behind uh, Camp and the Michael Van Turnout handbags at dawn. Um, <laughs> just could, had nowhere to go. They'd literally come to a stop on the course and were, were having a go at each other, basically. Um, and he was just kind of stuck behind. Didn't get the greatest of starts. There he is on the left-hand side of our screen. So already back in probably 15th, 16th position or so. But then, yeah, obviously caught up behind that fracas earlier on in the first lap. Yeah, you can just see the standing water on the track and what's making this one super muddy as Joris Neuvenhaus really now. It's Felipe Orts, the Spanish champ, right there in second spot. Easterbit doing what he can, maybe feeling a little bit of Wednesday's effort in his legs. Van de Puta right there behind him. Jor uh, Joris Wushira there just behind him. Jens Adams uh, all up there in the front. This one's still very much together as Joris Neuvenhaus, though, has maybe a few seconds over Felipe Orts. He does, he's already taken two wins in the Super Prestige Series, and you just said these conditions really, really suit Neuenhaus. Uh, fairly similar kind of the fitness test kind of conditions, a little bit like the World Championships were, and certainly how the Dutch Championships were, where he took out that jersey. And so the, the mud riders coming to the fore on this opening lap. Tone van den Bosch also right up there, uh, just looking to just stick in this one and continue to stay on a really consistent season. The Craylon Cordon rider, the Belgian rider there up in the front, but Joris Neuvenhaus, man, are looking really strong. We had him as our, well, for me, Ian, yeah, I had him as the absolute top favorite today to be able to do something here. And he says in his pre-race interview, I definitely heard him say that his legs were good. Um, and I, I believe I believe if we look back at his result at the Worlds just seven days ago, I have to believe that that form hasn't uh, dissipated too, too much. No, a form like that doesn't disappear in kind of uh, six, seven days. And for me, the out and out favorite as well, especially in these conditions on this course, just never really looks like he's trying yet. He's opening up the gap to the riders behind. Just a very silky smooth, lovely pedaling style. A little bit like we saw in the women's race, just that kind of that tempo, uh, that race tempo from these riders is the best way to ride this course. Just do your own pace, not go into the red too much. You see another bike chain, Lars van der Haar maybe wasn't able to get into the pit 
for that first time through. So taking that opportunity, the second pass through the pits to get a clean bike. Yeah, Vandahar last year overall victor in this series coming into this one super strong again on a course with the conditions like this probably not his ideal track although on a faster version of this course definitely very very good course for him punchy uh you know little small things that he's got to just kind of navigate but vanderhaar never count him out man he is one of the absolute goats of this sport and has done everything uh he is not a race or a overall or a Thing that he hasn't done except for maybe a world title. Vanderhaar's done just about everything, um, at least at the elite level. Oh, as Joris Neubenhaus cuts right across that line there to get uh, as much traction as he can. Certainly does. It looks like he's pulling away now over Ellie is a bit. They're coming around to finish the first lap already. Seven and a half minutes of racing. And the gap looks to be pretty established already. What's that going to be on the line? Probably eight, nine seconds perhaps on the line. Ian, almost two minutes faster than the first lap of the women's race. Uh, the conditions changing out here today. Lots of wind and no precipitation to drive this one out, surprisingly, uh, over the last few hours. The course definitely getting quicker for these riders as the day goes on. Um, we saw the opening laps of the women's race, very treacherous conditions in places, but this course actually getting easier as the day goes on. That light winds, no more rain, like you say, actually making things a little bit easier for these men on course. But a big chasing group forming. Lars van der Haar makes contact to Jens Adams' back wheel. Van and Boss, Ron Haar, Van Turnout. This is where we saw the fighting on the first lap, but those two making their way through now. Yeah, Ron Haar also kind of the sleeper for me on a track like this. If he gets his rhythm here, um, he's only we're only eight minutes into this. We've got quite a bit more racing to go. Ron Haar definitely also, in my mind, a big favorite for this one. He could, he could have easily been uh, off the front already, and we wouldn't have thought twice about it. He's such a young rider with so much potential. He's had such a good season, and on a course, it doesn't seem like there's anything that he can't do. He does seems to do better a little bit on some of the climbier tracks, but he's he's a really complete rider. The former under-23 world champ that uh, he was able to take that title not so far from here. So during the pandemic, uh, Pim Ronhar able to win that uh, under-23 world title. So everybody here doing what they can, but really, really on a solid day here is Joris Neuvenhaus. Riding sections that we haven't seen ridden yet today. Uh, Ian, he's definitely doing a doing really good job to stay super consistent and smooth as you see some of the other riders getting a little bit of a domino effect there, accordion effect just running into the back of one another on some of these sections where they're losing a little bit of momentum. And that's a big advantage, being out front on your own, riding your own pace, not getting caught up by any other riders, choosing different lines, not running into the back of them on any of these sections. So he's just able to ride his own pace and attack the parts of the course that he wants to attack and then kind of recover on other parts of the course as he's in for a bike change. Fresh tread, fresh pedals, uh, no mud in that new drive chain, but looks like Van den Bosch was just prizing himself clear of that chasing group. No. Vishura coming clear. Yeah, Vishura really, really strong. And, uh, you know, riding a good season. Big, big rider. Really good course for him here. He's only about seven seconds off, by my calculation, from that last shot where we could see where uh, Joris Neuvenhaus was against Vishura. So very good coming off of uh, the, the team of Bart Wellens, moving over to the Rudhoffs recently. So definitely uh, got good support around him. A young rider, definitely a, the next generation of riders to come. Um, it'll be really cool to see what he, uh, Ton Venenbosch, right? Some of these younger riders can start to do as they go up against kind of the, the more established generation of Iserbit, uh, Lauren Sweck, Michael Van Torenhout. It was definitely the season we were looking for anyone to kind of move on up and establish themselves. And I think the title have kind of most improved this season that has to go to Pim Ronhaas. Joris Neuenhaus with the first mistake that we've seen him put a foot wrong, had to get off and then yeah, one small mistake and he has to run the next banking, but all the other riders choosing to run as well. So uh, no real time lost there. Van der Haar still just dangling off the back of this leading group. Van Turnout making his way across. Van Turnout has been good. I mean, third at the World Championships, took that European title. Not as many victories as we typically see, although 
Michael Van Tornhout's always been a big podium contender, but he's not really been a, a, a huge, he doesn't win, you know, 20 races a year kind of thing. Well, no, no one, no one does, but you know what I'm saying. He's been a very, very strong, but very, very consistent rider, but we know he has the legs to, to be able to do this already third at the world championships you know like i said that european title he's rode a really solid end of his season in the middle it was a little bit after the european title there was an area where he just wasn't as good now we see this really a different line from joris neuvenhaus going right up to the top to all that fresh grass yeah interesting that they're now all choosing just to carry as much speed as possible to get up high and use that grass uh, that fresh grass for grip and then kind of traverse across and lose a little bit of height to carry as much speed as possible out of that section. So, yeah, course has got a lot easier compared to earlier in the day. The rider's able to carry more speed into sections and so therefore ride more than we saw earlier. But Vishura looks like he's closing this one down. He's moving clear of that group and moving up towards Nuenhaus. Yeah, the... Uh 2022 under 23 world champion uh, making his way up there. Uh, that uh, that's always that race, the under 23 world championships, always a predictor of success. So it's only usually not just uh, not like that it's imminent, but it's always kind of a matter of like when, you know what I mean? They're always coming. If they've been the under-23 world champ, you know, you think about Pim Verona, you think about Thibaut Nace. Uh, in this case, Washuda. There's definitely uh, some pedigree there if you've won the under-23 championships. You know, had some good results this year already on the podium at the Belgian championships, which some people equate to the world championships, especially on the elite men's side. Was um, was up there uh, for the elites in uh, Val de Soleil earlier in the year, third place overall. So some really good results for Jorn Wachuda. Definitely this, though, could be a career best. Second place at a super prestige. I'm not sure if he's accomplished that yet in his very young career, only 23 years old yet. No, his best so far this season in the Super Seas was sixth at Zolder, where he rode really, really well. Um, but this would be quite a large improvement. But right now, I think the danger man is Michael Van Turnout. The way he's managed to close down that gap to that chasing group and go all the way through it and now put them on the back foot, surging off the front of it. He's the man on the move in this race. Yeah, you have to ask yourself. You have to ask yourself what it would be if uh, he hadn't taken a 10, 10 second break there in the first uh, first turns. But that's that's for another day. Um, he's definitely doing uh, doing the work to make it across now. But uh, he's definitely found himself in a bit of a position here because he's got uh, this rider, Joris Neuvenhaus, just off the front now and um, definitely continuing to to build his gap. And we know from from Neuvenhaus, he doesn't like. He's, he's a guy that just doesn't like to sit around. Once he gets that momentum, once he starts locking in the course, he just starts to take time after section after section he starts to string these sections together and that's how he's won the other races that he's been so successful at it's been by uh, really consistent laps lap after lap after lap and uh, we see this time and time again this is not a rider you want to let off the front no we don't see uh, Neuenhaus throwing down like big attacks it just rides just a very very high tempo the whole way and just kind of rides people out of the wheel as such we saw him ride a very calculated race at the world championships rode completely his own pace that day wasn't lured into trying to go with van der Poel, go into the red and then fall back through the race just literally rode in the silver medal position that entire race at his own pace and then when michael van turnout started to come for him in the latter stages he could up the pace from there but for sure, falling back. So he surged out of that group, but then he's just beginning to fall him back now. Van Turn out makes himself clear, but he's got Lars van der Haar as a teammate of Neuenhaus stuck to that wheel. Yeah, right there you were seeing Michael Van Tornhout asking Van der Haar for a little bit of help. He's not going to do that, is he? And he's got uh, he's got his rider off the front. He's playing that team tactics card right now. There's no way that Van der Haar is going to help Michael Van Tornhout out. No, exactly that. And I think uh, if, if it was roles reversed, if it was Elias a bit clear um, and Lars Van der Haar flicked his elbow to Michael Van Tornhout to come through, he would give the exact same response. So uh, it's down to Michael Van Tornhout to try and close this one down now. Sure, just clear in second right now looking looking in control he must have gone into the red to kind of prize himself clear of that chasing group but doesn't look like he's overdone it too much 
Well, if you're just joining us, the top seven so far here at the eighth round of the Super Prestige up here in Middlekirke in Belgium, the North Sea Cross. We've got Joris Neuvenhaus from the Balawasa Trek Lions out in front. We've got Jorn Vishuda up there in second place, ready for the Craylon Cordon team. Michael Van Tornhout, the European champ in third. Mike uh, Lars Vanderhart in fourth place right now. In fifth, Ely Easterbit. In sixth place, Jens Adams. In seventh, Alpeson de Kunik Rider, Niels Van de Putte. So some of the top talent here uh, in cyclocross out for this North Sea Cross event. But right now, it is this rider here that is doing damage on everyone. Riding sections that we hadn't seen ridden before, cleaning everything, riding an absolutely perfect race so far. Only 15 minutes into this one, but man, it's going to be hard for anyone to come back to Neuvenhaus right now, in my estimation. It looks that way right now. Just, just has a beautiful leg speed. Just always can kind of up the leg speed for an obstacle ahead of him and just carry speed over the top just always on top of the gear never looks labored as we see other riders often having to run sections that Neuenhaus was able to power up over the top of. Jens Adams doing a good ride he put in a really solid ride at the World Championships just one of those riders always under the radar a little bit but always there or thereabouts. Throw the glasses there for Neuvenhaus as he comes through fresh machine seems like he's taking a, a bike every lap here no questions asked. No, just getting into that rhythm as we see. Even Neuenhaus kind of, yeah, losing his footing, goes down that hillside, gets rid of those glasses. But yes, obviously looks can be perceiving, uh, deceiving, sorry. Um, just leg almost folded underneath him with a little bit of fatigue there. Yeah. I think, too, it's also, <laughs> you can't imagine running downhill with a bike uh, at race pace. It's always like, oh, my gosh. But Vanderhaar now just going no bike for Vanderhaar and just tucking himself right up there, just letting Michael Van Tornhout know, hey, I'm still here as they now catch up with the uh, former under-23 world champ with Shuda here to uh, take up that race for second place. Vanderhaar changed in that second pit on the opening lap when the majority of people changed in the first pit. So whether he's just got into a rhythm of changing in that second pit, it'll be interesting to see whether he feels the need to change this time round. But this group all back together again. And if they're going to stand any chance of closing down Neuenhaus at this point, I think Van Turnout needs to go straight through on Vishura here. Ian, we were talking about in the women's race some of these troughs that are before these really steep bits that they come into, and on the in, you know, going into them and then coming out of them, where you know you kind of have all this compression on your front tire and you come into it. Tell us about those a little bit and what the riders are kind of facing because it's hard to see on TV just how treacherous some of this course is. You see them riding these sections; they just don't have enough speed or momentum. But when they come down some of these banks, they're really, really treacherous, and you can get really messed up. We saw it in the women's race. You can. It's big compressions at the bottom of these bankings and big ruts and it means that all your weight gets thrown forward through the wheels and so if you're not kind of in a straight line at the bottom of those it's really easy to get kind of pushed left and right at the bottom of those and can cause real problems. For sure with a problem oh, is that a rear met gone? No. Darn it. You can see the frustration there. Everyone's upset for Wishuda. Why? Why does it have to happen on such a good day with such good legs? You can see the frustration. This has happened to every good rider in their day, but real frustration for the Belgian there. He's going to take another look at it, but it looks to be kind of that it's uh, that it's over there. He's trying to do what he can, but Ian, this is the problem with this thick of mud. And as this is dried out, the mud's become thicker and thicker, and you can get that chain sucked there, and it looks as though for Wishura unable to get that chain dislodged from in between the bottom bracket and the crank set. Yeah, interesting that he couldn't get that one back out. It looked like it just come off the bottom of those rings. So in normal circumstances, you would be able to kind of push the rear mech, give yourself a bit of slack and, and pull that chain back onto those front rings. But for one reason or another, it doesn't seem to be able to, whether it's like completely lodged in there, like you say, with a bit of chain suck, a bit of old school chain suck, not something that kind of the modern bikes really have to deal with too much anymore. However, it looks like that one's completely lodged between the chain stay and the rings. Uh, yeah, heartbreak for uh, Wishura and all of his friends and family that are out today. It was on such a good day, but uh, yeah, we would have loved to have seen that for the Belgian rider and uh, would have liked to have known what could have been, but that's the name of the game, Ian. We've all had one. A mechanical is, uh, is part of it, and uh, yeah, you live to fight another day. Exactly, and it's why people leading these races, even though they have 20-30 seconds, you can't completely relax, and you just have to be careful with that machinery. Just 
keep changing on a regular basis like we're seeing with Newenhouse, that one lap change, just making sure that kind of you're lowering the chances of having a mechanical. You're not kind of getting rid of them, but the more often you can change, the less chance you will have, at, especially with a problem like that with chain suck. Yeah, for sure. And I think you're you're absolutely right. You know, it's never over until it's over. So every rider, you know, really. But that's why you've got to keep up with your bike changes. That's why you can't get lazy or get com complacent. You've got to go in for them because that's where you, you know, if you're off the front and you're doing well, but you decide, you know what, I'm not going to go in for a bike change. I'm going to push the equipment a little further. And I'm not saying that we should have did that, but that's where you get into real problems. As we see Kevin Kuhn, the Swiss ch former Swiss champ, coming through there, just going past with Shooter there. So that's probably just around 10th spot. We saw Pim Brunhar pass him just a bit ago now we see uh now we see up at the front though it is this man going through these whoop sections which traditionally super super fast but i'm really impressed today by joris neuvenhaus he's doing an absolutely perfect job of acing these sections but you can see even at the top level Ian, these sections really challenging the riders to get through just carrying speed where he needs to but 23 seconds back to Michael Van Turnout. We'll keep a check on that time gap because this is the man on the move. He's managed to get rid of Lars van der Haar at this point. He looks to be carrying really good speed through this section. If he can clean this section, we'll get a time track as they come across the line once more. So I'm just noting down 23 seconds right now back to second place. Yeah, we already see it. Uh Neuvenhaus coming through 22.45 for that rider as we see now Michael Van Tornat, as you said, that 23 seconds. Let's see if we can get a little bit of a split here as he comes through. And um, Michael Van Tornhout we know has come on later in these races. Uh, you know, as they get to this, just get to this point here going into, uh, yeah, about five laps to go. Let's see where he's at coming through. So 45, so that gap holding fairly, fairly similarly. 25 seconds now, Ian, for, uh, from Michael Van Tornhout as they come through. We'll keep a check on that time gap over the course of this next lap because this is the lap that's going to be the key. Michael Van Tornhout can take a few seconds back perhaps across the course of this lap and just begin to put Newenhouse under a little bit of pressure because right now he's just being able to ride his own tempo, not have to push things too much where he doesn't want to have to. Whereas when you're being closed down, you just begin to kind of panic ever so slightly and maybe try and go above your limit perhaps. But yeah, right now we're just trying to keep an eye on that time gap. Joris Neuvenhaus, former road professional, raced on the road very seriously at the at the World Tour level and uh, chose to come back to cyclocross full time just, uh, I believe, two years ago and linked up with Sven Nace and has done some uh, serious damage. I would say over each year, Ian, getting stronger and stronger and really, I would say this year, putting it all together. I mean, he is, if he's on the start line, he's a favorite for the victory. So you can never count Joris Neuvenhaus out, but I think for him, making that switch from the road over to cross, a really good decision. Oh, yeah. Got a feel for Vishura, just unbelievably bad luck. I do think he did change almost just before he had those bike problems. So, like you said, like you don't think he was gambling with the conditions with the bike, just really unlucky to, to lose the chain in that deep mud section before the planks and then to get it jammed so badly that he wasn't able to pull it out. Really unfortunate for him. But as you were saying about Newenhouse, this season he's really come alive and just shown a different level to perhaps what we've seen from him before. I know he was the under-23 world champion champion in the past but as you said he went on to the road um, raced for the what is now the, the DSM team but came back a couple of years ago Sven Nace uh, I don't know if I'd describe it as a gamble but he he took a chance with him and gave him a contract and it, now he's both are being kind of uh, rewarded with the results this season just phenomenal season that he is having uh, my favorite fact about him is he's had five wins this season He's got five career wins total, so that just yeah. goes to show how good this season is compared to previous seasons. Two wins in the Super Prestige, second at the World Championships, fourth last year at this race, so a course that he likes, and uh, well on his way so far to taking out the win today. Yeah, sure is. You know what I was going to note too was uh, when we saw Jordan Wishida there coming in, 23 years old, 
he really he really held himself well despite such a setback you know he really held himself well for such a young rider if we saw him pitch his bike and throw something we wouldn't have thought twice about that but you know really calm cool and collected from the belgian i give him a lot of credit for that because that's a that's a tough one to be riding to a career best and have it go sideways due to a mechanical for sure it's, it's always on the days when you're feeling your best and you're having a really good ride you <laughs> you never get a mechanical when you're struggling and, and down in 30th position it seems so uh, just really unfortunate for him and like you say just cool calm collected have a, had a few words with the mechanics i'm sure they were encouraging to him and uh, took that fresh bike and got on his way but van turnout has been closed down by van der haar now and i think that's going to mean that that gap will open up again to Neuenhaus because I'm sure Lars van der Haar won't go to the front and really push things on the front of this group now. No, he'll definitely get in the way. He'll, he'll, he'll slow things down just a touch. I mean, I do think that Neuvenhaus is in good position now, and now van der Haar may be feeling, you know, his chances are improving, especially if he's been studying Michael van Tornhout seeing where he's riding sections better he may make a charge to try to you know dispatch michael van tarnhout and really secure up second place so yeah lars vanahar definitely knows like i said one of the goats of this sport knows his way around definitely knows the style of michael van tarnhout knows when he's struggling and he'll know when to strike and to try to shoot out if he wants to uh try to make a run at uh, at joris neuvenhaus definitely and i think Lars, as, as experienced as he is and all the results he's had, uh, you would have said in the past the deep, heavy mud races used to be a weakness. However, this season, there's been some of his strongest rides. As we see, uh, Van der Putt's a really nice line all the way along the feet of those barriers, just about carrying enough speed to ride those planks. Pretty much the only rider now riding them within this race. As I was saying, Van der Haar's really come strong in the deep mud races this season. And, and once again today, in really, really tough conditions, He's showing how strong he is. Yeah, he is. Speaking of bad luck at big races, Vanderhaar at the World Champs uh, up there in the mix, really doing a great ride, and ends up with uh, what I believe to be a broken chain, which is total craziness because I haven't seen him have a broken chain in a very, very, very long time, if ever. I can't remember a race where I've seen Lars Vanderhaar bust a chain. So just terrible luck at the day of the World Champs, saying on his Instagram, like, mixed feelings because he was doing a really good ride but ended up just not able to uh, capitalize on the legs ends up 15th at the world which is definitely not what he would be expected to on a course that i think he's done really well at in the past historically yeah just really unfortunate i couldn't believe it when we got those images of him running with the snapped chain on that bike just as you say they're very very rare occurrences nowadays with the setups that these riders have just Chains don't snap, <laughs> um, and just just really unfortunate. And again, on a really good day, looking kind of towards that podium at the World Championships, it looked like he was coming strong near the back end of that race. And again, he, he's showing that form today. He's showing how strong he is to the back end of this season. Um, he's had a really good season. Um, I'd have said probably last year, perhaps the year before, maybe some question marks about kind of whether he's going to be able to continue right at the very front of the very big races but this season he's shown he's he, he's as good as ever he sure is you just saw Ely Easton a bit there back and forth spot the winner of the first three rounds of this series the uh super prestige in Overeisa was won by Easterbit the super prestige in Rudervorda won by Easterbit the Yamacht cross in Neil the midweek race for Ely Easterbit also then after that, in the Super Prestige, the Arbien Cross was won by Joris Neuvenhaus. The Super Prestige in Boom also won by Joris Neuvenhaus. Zolder was the big dog, Wout van Aert. And then in Degum, the night race was won by Mathieu van der Poel. Today, Joris Neuvenhaus is looking to try to add a third uh, victory in this Super Prestige to his Palmatis as he rips through these whoop sections here. Whoa, a little sideways there as he comes down that. So still fighting the conditions out here. Vanderhaar leading this one out. Definitely not going to be doing any work when he hits the road section and comes through to uh, to do the, the next lap here. That's for sure. It'll be up to Michael Van Tornhout if he wants to do any chasing and bring back any time here on Neuvenhaus. For sure. They're coming. Oh, problem for Van der Haar. Seeing how tricky this section of the course is time and time again. Just those compressions at the bottom of the uphills, sends the bike sideways, loses momentum and can't make it over the top of them with as much speed. But Joris Neuenhaus ticks off another lap. We're going to get a fresh time check as these two riders come round to the line very, very shortly. Van 
Carhart. Like I said, looks back at Michael Van Torenhout. Not going to push the pace, but also not going to push him to have to come through either. So right now, Van der Haar followed by Michael Van Torenhout here. Joris Neuvenhaus, followed by Van der Haar, Michael Van Tornhout, Iserbit. Let's see how the rest of the riders are getting on as we get a little bit of uh, just a little bit of uh, cheering going on there for Michael Van Tornhout from his team as he takes over the front now. Like you were saying, Ian, he might want to try to just make it across this. Typically, the midpoint of the race is a good spot to try to do that. Maybe three laps to go. You always say that, but looks like Michael Van Tornhout putting a little bit of an exclamation point here as he comes over on the front over Lars Van der Haar. Interesting that the previous lap, Van der Haar basically did the majority of the work and the gap to Neuenhaus stabilised. Exactly the same 25 second gap from the previous lap. And now Van Turnout was able to sit in the wheel for that lap. It looks like he's going to come to the front now and push things, perhaps feeling like Van der Haar was pushing things and perhaps went into the red ever so slightly. Now it's his turn to go over the top and try and open things up. Interesting style from Van Tornhout here, really trying to just solidify himself. Doesn't want to bring Lars Van der Haar across, but man, he's, he's the Jack Springer here. He's not going to be letting go. Uh, we know that we know that Lars Van der Haar can suffer. Um, he's definitely well known for that, and he's not going to just be letting Michael Van Tornhout go go away from him. He's going to do everything that he can, and he also wants to keep this rider here at Ely Easterbit at uh, at bay. So Van der Haar right on the heels of Michael Van Tornhout, even though. Michael Van Tornhout's trying to just turn up the pace right now and do everything that he can. So, yeah, we're uh, we're about the halfway mark of this race, although I do think it will run a little bit under the 60-minute mark. There's still a lot more to go here as these riders are doing everything that they can against this course. And you can see the difference here, Ian, on this part of the course where we see Joris Neuvenhaus riding that section. Michael Van Tornhout was able to get through, but eat through slowly. Van der Haar and Easterbit, both smaller riders, having to get off and run there. As we said earlier, it's just all about maintaining that momentum, maintaining that speed in the bike. And the best so far at that is this man on screen, Joris Neuenhaus, just carrying speed everywhere, just able to use that high cadence to really kind of speed up into features and carry a little bit more speed across the feature and out the other side. And that adds up over the course of a lap as we see Van Turnout and Van der Haar in for bike changes. Van Turnout still pressing on, just desperately trying to snap that elastic between him him and the Dutchman in third. Yeah, this is definitely a concerted effort. This is a big, big move here from Michael Van Tornhout to try to do what he can to dispatch Lars Van der Haar. Van der Haar definitely not giving up, though. You can see the look on Van der Haar's face. He's definitely got the lower lip hanging just a little bit. The spectators moving out of the way as Van der Haar looks for a little bit of green grass there on that right-hand side of your screen, the left-hand side of the course. So right now, the former Dutch champ doing everything that he can to stick on to Michael Van Tornhout. He wants to make this a 1-2 for the Balawasa Trek Lions. Not sure Lars van der Haan knows what giving up means. <laughs> um, <laughs> interesting that Neuenhaus just changed there ever so slightly, decided to dismount before the corner this lap rather than trying to ride around that corner and then dismount. So again, just learning as the course changes ever so slightly, just learning how to carry a little bit more speed round through these features. You see the difference in style a little bit. Uh, Michael Van Tornhout gets off on the drivetrain side of the bike. That's the right-hand side of the bike. Traditionally, most riders, uh, I would say 90%, get off on that left-hand side of their bikes. Uh, the non-drive side makes things a little cleaner when you're putting your bike up on your shoulder and running with the bike. You don't have the, the gears on your side, but look at the intensity from Michael Van Tornhout. He really wants to secure this one up, and we know he can do these late race charges, but look at the intensity right when he gets back on, pushing a big gear straight away, Ian. He's really pressing on now and just gaining confidence from that two, three, four bike lengths opening up back to Van der Haar. But we see there Neuenhaus carrying the speed out and that kind of carries all the way down the next section of the course. So if you're able to carry a little bit more speed for a feature, it has a big knock-on effect with that gap just starting to open up between these two riders. As you say, you get buoyed with confidence when you do see that gap opening up. But a slight mistake from... Van turn out perhaps, but Van der Haar can't make too much inroads over there. As we see, all of the riders struggling apart <laughs> from Neuenhaus across that section. You see, that was a perfect example of how carrying more speed across that feature just adds up on the exit point. 
Yeah, well, it's interesting because Neuvenhaus riding the best race, but also I think the strongest today. And you can see him, he's able to punch it into that section, Ian, take his momentum, get him all the way to the top of that hill, and then use that fresh grass to kind of glide his way down with all that traction. That's definitely a show of not just his strength, but also the panache and the style that he's riding with today. He's definitely, he's going with a completely different technique, but he's doing it because he's the strongest. Exactly. It takes a big effort to kind of climb that little bit higher up that banking. And he's kind of got energy to spare to be able to do that. But as a result, he just kind of, he must be taking back probably two, three seconds on the chasers every time through that section, of course. Yeah, no, riding definitely super, super good. And he's got these lines absolutely nailed today. But what an effort here. Now Easterbit also out for blood. He's coming down. He's hunting Vanderhaar down as well. So this race for second place is very, very uh, hotly contested right now. As It seems as though Easterbit also wants to be on the podium today. He can sense Vanderhaar being distanced by his teammate. And so he's making a really big effort now to get up to that back wheel of Lars Vanderhaar. Van Turnout has taken back three seconds on Neuenhaus just in this lap. So it just goes to show how hard and how fast Michael Van Turnout is riding across this lap. Ian, what do you think? Will Michael Van Turnhout continue to press on here as they go through the lap? Uh, or do you think if he comes back, he's going to sit up and then try to play the team card? I think it depends how close Van der Haar is able to remain across the final portion of this lap. If, if Van Turner holds this gap, I'm sure he'll continue to press on, knowing that Van der Haar will be kind of a little bit hesitant, perhaps, if Isabit's in the wheel. Um, but if Van der Haar's kind of only two bike lengths back when they get to that finishing straight. But a bike change now for Van der Haar. We had seen him changing in this pit previously, so obviously feels that that's the better choice for him right now or just potentially needing to change every half lap to yeah, mitigate kind of the chances of having a mechanical but that means that that gap has now completely opened up between Van Turnout and Van der Haar. Lars Van der Haar's pops there in the pits giving him a new machine with just a little bit of a push right off the back seat there as Van der Haar takes it that makes it feel as though you're not taking grabbing onto like a big brick when you run into it you have to have a good a good pit crew a good mechanic to just be able to give uh, to give you a little boost as you go through you see this great overhead shot of the riders as they come through you can see how hard they're struggling to get through this section this is top sport this is the best riders in the world really struggling on those banks there as you are some even house laps through now I wonder whether Van der Haar had a slight issue with the bike to really feel the need for that extra bike change um, because that's really cost him. He was only a couple of bike lengths back over Michael Van Turnout, but it meant that Isabit overhauled him. But Van Turnout waits ever so slightly for Isabit, but that's actually going to allow Van der Haar back to the wheel. 24 seconds, so that gap's still stable. So even though we saw that really hot lap from Michael Van Turnout on the previous lap, he only took back one second on the flying Joris Neuenhaus. Crazy, huh? So 24 seconds, it's really hanging out there. We saw Michael Van Turnhout, I think, as close as 23 seconds, but they really haven't been able to bring any time back here as we get a slow-mo. So right now, at the front, it's Joris Neuvenhaus, followed by this rider, Ely Easterbit. Then it's this rider, Michael Van Turnhout followed by Lars van der Haar right here, riding with that number four on. So all these riders, this is the race though for the podium for sure. Everybody behind gonna have to do it in an absolutely monumental ride if they wanna come back to this race and hop up on the podium. We've seen mechanicals, we've seen small crashes, but uh, right now, Ely Easterbit uh, with the one with the most forward momentum here, the winner of Maldehem on Wednesday, the Belgian champ putting it together here uh, today at the North Sea Cross. Interesting how it's kind of ebbing and flowing, different riders looking faster at different laps. So you'd have said earlier on, the way Michael Van Turnout came through in those opening couple of laps after that first lap incident, you'd have said he had the momentum, he had the legs, and he was going to be kind of the most obvious going for that second place. And Isabit was falling back across those laps. And now it looks like Isabit's got the impetus, and he looks like the fastest on course right now. I agree. Yeah. Easterbit recently in an interview said that um, just in general, in his general form, that he's completely dead. Like he says his legs are gone. He doesn't feel good. But, uh, you know, maybe it's the mental.
uh, strength that he has, you know, he's continuing to just put it together. Uh, so maybe it's just one of those things where, he's, you know, he's just, he's got a lot of stress, his body's beat up, but when he gets in the race, the adrenaline's fueling him on. What do you think of that, Ian? He's saying publicly, I'm dead, but yet he's continuing already at the Worlds did a great race, right? He was able to put it together. He just won in Maldahem. Now here, we see him on the podium. Maybe it's just uh, kind of deflecting the pressure a little bit across these final <laughs> few races. He's already wrapped up the Super Prestige Series, so he's just going for race wins as such. So maybe just trying to take a little bit of pressure off himself. But also, sometimes you can just be really mentally fatigued from the traveling, the racing, the training. It's been a long season for him in particular, being kind of a cyclocross specialist, doing as many races as the, as the cross boys do. Um, so maybe he's just mentally fatigued and so he feels dead when kind of interviewed but then come race day he's clearly still got very very good form left in those legs as we've seen over the previous uh, few weeks taking out that win on Wednesday in Maldegum just looked very very strong good ride in Tabor in conditions that probably wouldn't suit him down to the ground and and again doing a really good ride today on a course and conditions that perhaps traditionally wouldn't suit the likes of Isabit. And if you weren't with us for the pre-race interviews, uh, Ely Isabit showed up in a Ferrari. So he does not want to be done on any uh, anything today. He's coming in the Ferrari. He's got the good legs. He was there, and uh, he's putting together a big day. So he's going to go home a happy man with his overall title and uh, to be uh, to be making out of here in a, uh, in a big, bright red Ferrari on a gloomy Belgian day. He's going to be really happy. And not to mention, Ian, there's quite a bit of money on uh, on tap for the overall winners. Both the men's and the women's uh, first place taking 25,000 euros uh, out of this one for the overall. 16,000 euros for second place, 10,000 euros for third place. So definitely not chump change for any of these riders that are uh, looking and staring down an overall placing in this series. Definitely not. It looks like Isabit and Van Turn out. Now that they've distanced Van der Haar, they're going absolutely all in to try and close down this gap. And it does look like they've closed down perhaps a few seconds on this man, on Neuenhaus. I'm going to try and get a time check, but we're into that section of the course that Neuenhaus has ridden so well. The speed that he carries out of that section, just really, really smooth. Yeah, that's one of the ones that you look back on if you're Isabit or Michael Van Torn out and you're like, ah, oh, man, we just didn't see that. We just didn't see that possibility there and you get frustrated. But yeah, they're they're really they're really doing it. The gap there, they're going all in now on this one. They're doing everything that they can to try to beat up on each other. And that's definitely going to put a little bit of pressure on Neuvenhaus. What do you think in the pits, Ian? They're definitely going to be letting him know that they're starting to force the issue behind. Definitely. I just did uh, a homemade kind of time check and I make it 10 seconds. So they've really taken time out of him. Isabit is absolutely flying across this lap. Oh my goodness, the race is back. Potentially, Isabit coming back into the front of this one now. It's Joris Neuvenhaus struggling a little bit on this section. So maybe Neuvenhaus having a little bit of a bad moment at this exact second, Ian, and Isabit and Michael Van Torn out looking to capitalize here in Middlekerke. Look at the risk Isabit's taking, foot out, flat out through that corner, Van Turn out the same, bike going sideways. And I don't think it's going to be long before Isabit makes his way back to Joris Neuenhaus' wheel. <laughs> we have a bike race on our hands here at the North Sea Cross. You can hear the Belgian fans are yelling for the Belgian champ, Ely Isabit. Come on, let's go. Isabit, can you do it? We don't know, but he comes into the sand section from all the precipitation over the last days. The sand is not as heavy as it is, but watch Neuvenhaus now feeling the pressure. He can hear the crowd as he goes through here. He knows how close Ely Easterbit is in. He can see it now, down to five seconds. So they started this lap with a 25 second gap. So potentially the lights have just gone completely out for Neuenhaus across the course of this lap. Wow, Isabit putting down a foot, not even playing, but listen to the Belgian crowd here. You can hear it through the ambient. This is definitely forcing Isabit to push on and do everything that he can here. The Belgian champ, winner in Maldahem on Wednesday, almost making a connection here with this rider who now you can see, you can see a little bit on his face and just how fatigued he actually is as he comes into this one, not expecting this from Isabit. No, I think he'll be very, very surprised to see that gap come down as quickly as it had. Van Turn out a little shake of the head perhaps. I don't think he can believe the speed of Isabit, the way he's ridden on this lap. But right now, just that gap, four seconds, looks perhaps a little bit closer. Ooh. Ian, what do you think here? Isabit, what's his tactic when he reaches this rider? If he does connect with him, does he go straight through him or is he going to need to sit up? I think he's gone so hard for 
quite a long period of time that I think he'll catch him around about the end of this lap towards the uh, start finish straight. So I think he'll probably just want to get contact to that back wheel and then take a little bit of recovery, especially he's got a teammate behind in the form of Michael Van Turn out. Be interesting to see what Neuenhaus does. Does look like they're going to make contact just in time for that start finish straight. Psychologically, easier bit now, it definitely in the power position. 100%. Um, we obviously don't know how each rider is feeling, whether Neuenhaus is kind of okay, I've just been riding tempo, um, he's come back to me, so be it, we, we go again, sort of thing. 15 minutes of racing remaining, two laps to go and whether Isabit's on the absolute limit, just happy to get across that gap, and now he needs to recover. Well, now we have a bike race on our hands, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Ely Easterbit, the Belgian champion, taking over the front of this race for the first time. Joris Neuvenhaus, the Dutch champ, on the front, almost pin to pin, leading this one out. Ely Easterbit put in an absolute scorcher of a lap and is not playing games here against the Dutch champ. He's going to have his hands full as he now starts to study the lines of Ely Easterbit. Is he stronger or is he riding a section differently than I am? Is what the question that uh, Joris Neuvenhaus is going to be asking himself. Michael Van Tarnhout also back there licking his chops seeing if he can do any damage here uh, and keep up with his Belgian champ uh, Ely Easterbit as he comes through right now but Easterbit putting on the pressure Ian running these sections doing everything he can to get in the head of Joris Neuvenhaus to me it looks like Neuvenhaus's legs have just completely gone um, when it kind of looks a little bit like kind of a, a sugar low almost kind of just can't go any faster though, even though he's trying to stick on the wheel of Isabit but just having to almost let him go at this point be interested to see whether he can kind of come round from this at all yeah I didn't see a gel or anything under his leg so he doesn't have any sugar on board so he's definitely going to be having to fight through a bad moment we've all been there Ian where you've been in the race and you've thought oh I've got a little bit of a, a, a sugar low here I'm just uh, kind of blocked up mentally you just start making bad decisions so let's see if uh, let's see if Joris Neumannhaus can put this one back together but Easterbit does not need an invitation he's riding sections that he hasn't ridden he knows this is his moment to try to be able to take this one out and win again here at the North Sea Cross yeah, just opening up the gap and Neuenhaus for the wow. first time just dismounts way before that feature gets off, trots his way to the top, remounts, and right now pole position is a bit. Wow, we have not seen this from Joris Neuvenhaus where the lights have just gone out. He's definitely having a really bad moment in this race here on the seventh lap. He's not able to uh, to stick with Ely Easterbit. Easterbit brings back 20 plus seconds in one lap, then goes straight through the Dutch champ. So right now he's going to be doing everything he can to just kind of tread water, you know, get to this, get through the rest of this race, stick with Michael Ventura. Now that's the owner of the uh, of the Powell Sausage Bingo team there on the sidelines, giving encouragement to the Belgian champ now yeah the momentum that is a bit has now you just can't see anyone being able to come back and Michael Van Turn out now up and over Joris Neuenhaus for that second place as well Neuenhaus doing everything that he can to just get to, to just bail the water out of the boat this water that's come in over this last lap but he's just doing everything that he can to bail it out and do what he can to stick on the wheel of Michael Van Turn out you know you just don't want to let him get too far away if it's out of sight it's out of mind so right now everything that Joris Neuvenhaus can do to just stick in this one right now. So he's doing he's doing the work, he's sticking on his wheel, but he's definitely had a moment of bother here. And you can see that the facial expression of Neuvenhaus has changed quite a bit, Ian. Very interesting as he exited the pit then, he kind of gave the hand signal to say he's done. So uh, just obviously feeling completely empty at this point of the race, 45 minutes of racing was done and then the wheels just look like they've come off for him and yeah, it's kind of almost no time to retrieve things at this point. I mean, even a gel at this point isn't going to help too much. Only a lap and a half to go. Wow. For Easterbit, he's played this one to absolute perfection. I would say in the first 15 minutes of this race, I, Easterbit was in it, but I definitely did not look like the best rider on the day. But, man, he has cranked the uh, volume up to 10, and he's doing everything that he can. But look at this, Ian. Now Michael Van Torn out after dispatching uh, Joris Neuvenhaus. I believe he's coming back to Easterbit. He is. This is, this is such <laughs> swings and roundabouts on such a tough course. It's 
it's almost like people have gone a little bit too hard and then they just pay for it and then someone else can come up and put their surge in and close down pretty big time gaps over the course of a short period of time when you're feeling strong and can really attack one section of the course carry a little bit more speed all the way through a little feature like this one that we're seeing and Michael Van Turnau is coming back to his team leader is a bit Wow, the European champion has not taken many victories this year. Definitely wants to be able to put another one on the uh, on the results sheet for him. And this is definitely going to be one of those races. I believe Michael Van Tarnhout is the one that really wants this one. He's the one that's coming back. He's yo-yoed back and forth, but he definitely over the last weeks has shown that he's got the best form. I believe this is a duel between teammates. We haven't seen a good battle like this amongst these two in a while, Ian. This is going to come down. Michael Van Tarnhout now really doing everything, turning himself inside out to get back to east of it this is a fascinating race the <laughs> way it's kind of swung this way and that and i'm sure is will be surprised to see my michael van turnout returning to his rear wheel because when is went michael van turnout didn't really have a response didn't really have an answer and fell back quite rapidly over the course of that super fast that that is put in but right now the gaps at two seconds can he close this one down with just over a lap to race yeah, we're in the heart of Belgian cyclocross up on the coast in West Flanders with two of the biggest Belgian stars of this sport going head to head here for the battle of the final Telenet Super Prestige. The eighth round, Ili Iserbet, your overall series leader, looking to try to put his stamp on this one, take his fourth victory from this year in this series right now. Michael Van Tornhout looking to add another W onto his results sheet for this year. Can he do it? That's the question. There's still one lap to go after they come through. They'll be getting the bell lap. Whoa, we've got a good race on our hands. And this rider here put on a show early on, but um, but not able to stick with the two Powell Sauce and Bingo riders. Van Turnout just rode that really, really clean feet up, really attacked that uphill section, was able to ride around that corner, no feet down, just as Newenhouse does, whether he's just kind of beginning to feel a little bit better again, but we saw Isabit on the ragged edge, just dragging himself up and around that one. You can tell the adrenaline and sort of the the trying to make a way like a bank robber. Easterbit's under pressure right now, isn't he, Ian? He is. He's riding scared. He's being chased yeah. and hunted down by Van Turnout. Neuenhaus not completely out of it at this point. If one of these kind of explodes over the course of uh, the last lap, but is a bit just desperate not to allow Van Turnout back to that rear wheel. No, he is riding. He is riding these sections, and he knows he's got to do eight more minutes. And as a cross rider, Ian, you know eight minutes is nothing, right? You can do anything for eight minutes if you're a cyclocross racer. You're like, yeah, oh, yeah, I'll just turn myself inside out for this. I will absolutely put myself into the pain box. But sometimes at this level of sport, sometimes someone's just better. But these two look super evenly matched today. They do. It looks like Michael Van Turnout just beginning to feel the pace ever so slightly and just hasn't been able to close down those final few bike lengths to the rear wheel of Ellie Isabet. He'll be up and round onto that start finish straight once again and we'll hear the bell this time. Here he goes, the bell lap. That's what you love to hear when you're a cross racer. But this one's going to go over an hour. Uh, so this is it. Three seconds now for Michael Van Tornhout. That's nothing. Easterbit here running like he's got uh, nothing to lose, trying to do everything that he can to take this one out. So right now, Ely Easterbit up on three seconds on Michael Van Tornhout. And followed by Joris Neuvenhaus now in third spot at 19 seconds. Again, another huge swing in the time deficit between Isabit and Neuenhaus on that lap, but maybe an indication that Isabit's beginning to feel his own pace as he kind of trips and leg gives way ever so slightly underneath him as he dismounted the bike down into that muddy downhill run. Yeah, Ian, you know all about the adrenaline of being in that position, especially with the Belgian crowd out there at a proper Belgian cross. Like, these guys are feeling that intensity of the crowd cheering them on and the opportunity to win again here at the end of the season. I believe both of them really want to win this race, and that's what I'm seeing happen here is, like, I'm seeing these guys kind of, you know, light the whole pack of matches on fire, as we say over here. Like, they're not playing any games right now. They're doing everything that they can to try to win this one. Forget about Lilla tomorrow. Don't even talk about that. Let's just try to fight this one out today for the victory. They're there's not, in their minds right now, there's not another day to race. They're doing everything that they can to try to take this one. 
for sure. It's almost like the team managers put an extra bonus up for this race. The way <laughs> these two are going all in with one lap to go, just yeah, kind of battering each other for this win today. No one else in contention right now. They pulled clear of everyone else in the race. Is a bit still attacking these sections, just trying to carry as much speed as he can over the top of these features. Yeah, he's trying to put Michael Van Turnhout away, and that is very telling, Ian, that section. Michael Van Turnhout not able to ride that. Now you can see a foot out. That may have been the straw that broke the camel's back there, as we say. It's just a little bit too much, as we see Michael Van Turnhout shedding some serious time on that section to Easterbit. Definitely, that might be race over for Michael Van Turnhout. Just unable to get up over that first uphill and then just not carrying the same amount of speed in, onto the next downhill and therefore into the next up. So one of those key sections of the course where just carrying a little bit more speed in at the very start, just kind of times 10 as you exit. So uh, is a bit with the advantage right now into the pits, probably for the final time. He's a bit with a bike change there. Smooth it has to run a little bit further just because of how deep the mud is. You know, you cannot power through some of those sections as you see Michael Van Torn out getting his bike very early on in the pits, getting it on that opposite side where it's not as chewed up. He's able to take a little bit of an advantage by getting on that uh, goofy side of the bike on the drive side of the bike. So Michael Van Torn out there, though, pedaling a little bit more of squares here. And that's always a sign of a lot of fatigue. The gap around 10 seconds now to uh, Easterbit from uh, uh, Michael Van Torn out to Easterbit. Look at the fatigue on Neuenhaus' face when he changed bikes then, just completely empty at the end of this one. Almost feel like he's going to struggle to finish the race at this point. Yeah, definitely, like, sputtering a little bit, but he's got a really good gap built up over his teammate Lars Vanahar, but never say never for Vanahar. We know that he can eke out the podium here, but listen to the crowd here. Give the big cheer for this guy. Easterbit now finishing this one off with real style as he wants to take this overall victory and be the most winningest rider of this series for this year. Uh, four victories if he's able to put this one away, which is more than anybody else. Definitely stamping his authority on this series. He's already won the overall in the Super S series. So, yeah, wants to take out yet another win. This will be his 49th career win, so uh, rapidly approaching that big 50 mark, which not too many riders have got to in their careers. No, still riding though, a bit scared, Easterbit. You can see the look on his face. He's like not getting on in certain sections, even though the gap's gone out to almost 15 seconds now. He's doing that everything that he can to just really, you know, finish this one off. He knows the competitor that his teammate Michael Van Tarnhout is. He knows he doesn't want to lose this one. I have to say, Ian, if Michael Van Tarnhout didn't get into that disagreement with uh, <coughs> earlier in the race with Ryan Camp, what could have been? You know, he gave up 10 seconds or something there, and I think he'll look back at that and think that was a bit silly in the end. 100%. It wasn't just the time gap, was it? It was all of those positions that he gave away. So over the course of the rest of that first lap, he had to come round people. And it, it's not the easiest, of course, is to have to ride offline as such. There's kind of one really good racing line through a lot of these features. And so he must have been kind of having to expend energy that he really didn't want to have to in the kind of opening 10, 15 minutes of this race. And looking back, you do kind of think that potentially cost him the win today. Yeah, and it also spikes your adrenaline when you get into, you know, just even a verbal, just like, a, you know, bantering with someone like that. You get you get kind of fired up, as we see Neuvenhaus still acing that section really, really strongly. But anyways, we're talking here about this guy at the front, the Belgian champ. He's definitely doing all of these sections perfectly. The fans are pushing him on. You can see all of them have their cell phones out across the side, watching him rip through this so that they can post it up on their social media. They're going to be proud of the Belgian champ as you see them all out there clapping for Easterbit as he just rips this for the final time trying to put this one away and uh, put his hands up at the end here. This has been a really, really tough race and the way the race has swung this way and that. To be honest, if you had asked me after 30 minutes of racing, I would have said race over in terms of the win, but it's been unbelievable last 20 minutes of racing. I completely agree with you. I did not see this coming. Uh, Easterbit definitely has surprised me in this one. As you see him just tuck that rear wheel in. It's like he actually studied the track, watched his competitors, but he rode a really mature race in. He sat back, waited for his moment, and then absolutely punched it right up to the top and then made his move. And when he struck, it was like he had venom, man. He just hit him really hard all at the same time and put it all together. I wonder how much was tactical and perhaps how much was just the way he felt whether it just took him a little while to open up. He raced on Wednesday, whether he's taken it easy since then, I would have thought he has. Maybe he just didn't quite warm up 
enough. Um, took him 15, 20 minutes to sort of really get going and find the really good legs of late. Or whether, like you say, perhaps he was just holding back, knowing that it was a really tough course, a really hard race, and so he needed that kind of energy come the last 30 minutes. So I'm sure he'll tell us in his interview afterwards. He certainly will. Here it is. Joris Neuvenhaus coming in, acing that section, still riding some of these sections better. But uh, it's these sections where Easterbitz really putting down Watts, doing everything that he can to just keep his forward momentum. But Joris Neuvenhaus still riding a technically really good race, despite clearly just not with uh, not not having the best moment uh, in the middle part of this race. Easterbitz, though, continuing to just ace these sections. There's not much more to go for the Belgian champ now. No, this final really tricky section of the course, and then it won't be long before he turns on to that finishing straight and take out yet another Super Prestige win. Well, well, well. Ely Easterbit there giving a... <laughs> it's Mario De Klerk, one of the uh, one of the big guys in the program of the Powell Sauces big goal team, giving some, uh, some real encouragement there to the Belgian champ. Ely Easterbit as Easterbit's going to be coming up onto the road to finish this one off. It's the man that came in the big red Ferrari Testarossa today, comes in to take the eighth and final round of the Super Prestige here in Middlekirka. Ely Easterbit is today's winner. Wow, looks like Michael Van Turnout just kind of steam ran out of his chase in the end over the course of that last half a lap and the gap just went out astronomically <laughs> to his bit in the end 23 24 seconds on the line Neuenhaus wow. even further back wow what a day what a day i definitely didn't see that one coming but Neuenhaus finished this one off he's going to be given a <laughs> he looks to be happy with that one look at the expression <laughs> from him there that's as telling as anything I think that's a bit of a sly grin of what the hell happened there. <laughs> Seriously. Well, the teammate of yours, Neuvenhaus, Lars Vanahar, coming through, put in a great ride today. Uh, fourth place, nothing to be ashamed about on that one. Super solid all year long for Vanderhaar. He comes through. Both these guys, kind of ultimate teammates, right? At one point, Michael Van Tornhout uh, looking out for Ely Easterbit. And in the other part of the race, it was Lars Vanderhaar looking out for Joris Neuvenhaus. It looked absolutely perfect for the Balawas Trek Lions team. About 20 minutes into this race, they had Neuenhaus out front. Van der Haas puffing out the cheeks there shows how hard this race has been. Yeah, Van der Haar on the wheel of Van Turnout is a bit being distant, and it was kind of a really good day at the office for them. And how it switched in the last 30 minutes, I'm still struggling to comprehend. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, but man, I'll tell you, it was like uh, it was like an all-out attack. Like the the like if you're watching the Grand Tour when they hit the mountains, you didn't see it coming. Everyone was struggling, but man. They, uh, they came in with a force today. They uh, they definitely, the, the Powell Sauce's big goal team, did everything perfectly, timed it to perfection, um, and put it together, uh, as did this rider, Niels Van Der Putte, put together a really, really good day. Love to see uh, love to see the young Belgian rider uh, just finishing up his studies at college, still up here in the top five on a, what's been a really good year for him with some very, uh, really monumental results. He's done, a, he's done a good job, maybe a little less consistent than he probably would have wanted, but then to put to there today putting this one together and it's going to be uh jens adams you know, coming in for six spots yeah van to put it whenever you need finesse and skills he comes to the fore and one of those courses today where his skills were rewarded he took out that second place in val de soleil that world cup that takes place on snow and ice where it's all about finesse and he's such a smooth smooth rider another really good mud rider felipe orts coming in for seventh he'll be happy with that one ron ha he got caught up in that early first lap carnage when Mark Van Turnout and Ryan Camp came to a halt. Mewson comes in for ninth. Tice Arts in tenth. One of the better rides for him this season.
Lauren Sweck coming through with 11th spot, the former Belgian champ coming in. Kind of not the season that he would have liked to have had. I saw him when I was over in December with his uh, wife and uh, his kids out there. Uh, so definitely lots, lots to do for, uh, for <laughs> with two young kids for Lauren Sweck these days. He's a busy man and he's been racing for a really long time. Orts, definitely. I think uh, the faces after this race, Ian, tell the story of how hard this one actually was. It definitely is. It's not often that you see everyone completely knackered at yeah. the end of a cyclocross race, as we see Brian Camp, our uh, first lap fighter. Both those guys, good guys. So, I, you know, they'll work it out. You know, this is life. Uh, Michael Van Torn out, Ryan Camp having some words there, but uh, it's yeah, that'll, that'll get worked out. Dan Suta coming through there, uh, another rider that's definitely uh, riding through the generations, but it was all about this man today, Eli Isserbit, the Belgian champ, not even looking like he had to go hard, although he certainly was, um, but definitely put it together today to take another victory here uh, in Middelkirke. Well, Ian, that was a day. Uh, that definitely got me. Uh, the coffee was already in my veins, but it definitely uh, spiced up the day with these two riders, man. They made it exciting for us and for the fans. Uh, I really enjoyed that one. They certainly did. Probably one of the best races of the season so far, just not knowing it was over until it was <laughs> completely over. But hats off to this man. Went out yeah. really hard. Established that gap early on, looked super comfortable, looked like he was managing it. And then, yeah, the lights just completely went out with 15 minutes remaining. And I'm sure he'll know the answer. But, uh, yeah, right now he's going to be feeling pretty empty. Kevin Kuhn coming in. Yeah, so nice very to curious. see. Nice to see Dan Suter back up there in the top 15, coming back from uh, long COVID, which has taken him out an awful large chunk of this season. Here's Isabit. Yeah, I was asking myself too, I was going to I think that Nieuwenhuis was still still. I knew in the beginning that the long race in the last year was going to happen. It was super hard and I had to to the first 14 minutes to get my own tempo. To rein. Op een gegeven moment maakte ik wat veel foutjes en dan dacht ik van kom terug de focus. Ik kom naar Lars rijden, naar Michael en uh, ja, ik probeer eigenlijk met Michael naar Nieuwenhuis te rijden. En dat lukt en dan uh, ja, zag ik dat ik een hartje had, dus dan probeer ik wel door te rijden. Maar het was wel een enorm lastig. Hoe hadden jullie daar eigenlijk veel geloof in dat jullie dat kloofje nog gingen dichten? Want in Nieuwenhuis normaal gezien valt die niet meer stil als die vertrekt blijft hij ook weg. Ja, uh, in Tabor zag ik ook dat Michael wel korter kwam en dat nieuwe huis dat wel wegreed. Dus wist ik dat hij heel snel begin had, maar dat hij misschien een dipje kon krijgen. En als de supervorm van vorige week weg is, wist ik dat het mogelijk was. En uh, denk, mentaal doet wel veel, direct 10 seconden af, nog eens 10 seconden af. En dan uh, ja, is het kwestie van erop en erover te gaan en hem volledig te breken. En ik denk dat dat goed gelukt is. Hoe zwaar was het eigenlijk vandaag? Want je bent echt serieus aan het uh, uithijgen. Ja, enorm zwaar, maar... Uh, in het begin bolde het niet echt bij mij en ben ik naar Griffo gegaan en heb ik heel de wedstrijd op Griffo gereden en dat ging wel iets beter. En ik weet dat mijn laatste twee, drie ronden wel uh, echt goed zijn dat ik dan nog altijd iets over heb en dat was eigenlijk vandaag ook het geval. Ik heb eigenlijk tempo gereden. Had ja, tempo. Tempo dat ik goed vond tot, tot minuut 35, 40 en dan probeerde te versnellen en dat is mooi gelukt. Nummer 10 van dit seizoen is binnen. Nummer 50 in totaal bij de profcarrière nog niet. Maar je maakt daar een heel groot doel van. Hè? Zijn dit soort dingen, de dingen die je nodig hebt om gemotiveerd te blijven als al die kampioenschappen en klassementen achter de rug zijn? Ja, daar, daar was ik wel mee bezig ook vandaag. Uh, het zou heel mooi zijn, 50 in 5 jaar, dat is 10 per jaar. Dus, dat is je zit nu aan 49, hè? Ja, absoluut. Dus, uh, ja, we weten weer wat doen. Morgen gaat het wel moeilijk zijn. Ik voel wel dat ik diep geweest ben, dus denk ik niet dat morgen uh, erop zal zijn. Maar we gaan ons best doen. En, uh, ja. Het zijn, dan nog, uh, vier, het zijn nu nog vier wedstrijden voor mij, dus uh, ik hoop wel nog eentje mee te pikken hierna. Proficiat voor vandaag en uh, succes in die zoektocht naar 50. Hè? Ian, what do you think of that? Quick thoughts? Just said that he was making some mistakes early on and riding his own tempo for 30 minutes and then 
it kind of all clicked and uh, suddenly was able to find kind of a, a higher speed, a higher pace. And then, yeah, he was surprised that Neuenhaus came back because at the World Championships when Van Turnout tried to go across to Neuenhaus, he, he was able to speed up and had something in reserve to go away again. So interesting that, yeah, kind of, he was surprised at the way it panned out, but he also commented on just how tough the race was. Yeah. I think Neuvenhaus is probably the most surprised by that, but yes, <laughs> definitely uh, a really strong ride there. And I also, uh, I also think that he was, uh, like he said, he figured that course out after 30 minutes. And then, you know, sometimes you do do that, where you ride a second half faster after you kind of start to ace some of the sections. But he didn't ride things super much more cleanly. It just found, just to my, in my impression, it's like he found his legs. His legs found him, maybe, and um, he was able to really power forward and make uh, and make a day of it in the end because he certainly was. He was good, but uh, he was really good at the end. Yeah, he really kind of sped up towards the end there. Um, I think he was talking about perhaps trying different tyres where he did go onto the the Griffo for those final few laps as he started make less mistakes. I think that's what he said. Just trying to see from uh, the images here. It does look like perhaps he went onto the Griffo, so just found some extra speed from them perhaps as well. Certainly an interesting choice. You got to be a very, very experienced rider to be able to tell your uh, pit crew, hey, I'm going to be switching over to the traditional tread and uh, to get my bike prepared uh, in the middle of a really heavy race. But this is how it went off. Green meant go, and it was all out. It was Niels Vandeputta, the rider on the right-hand side from Alpes and de Kunic, that took this one out. And this, Ian, was where we saw a little bit of argy-bargy happening. Yeah, it looked like camp was just kind of running across Michael Van Turnout, and this was definitely leftovers from Maldegum the other day when they were, yeah, once again going at each other during the race, obviously ex-teammates, no love lost there, and it kind of, yeah, looking back, cost Michael Van Turnout the race, as we see Bishura having a great race today, and then all of a sudden that dropped chain, chain suck problems. And at this point in the race, this was when Michael Van Turnout came flying through, was able to take Van der Haar with him, and it looked like Isabit was just being distanced ever so slightly. Yeah, exactly. And Michael Van Turnout, I think, at this point thought, yeah, I might ride across to Joris Neuvenhaus, right? Let go of Lars Van der Haar. Van der Haar at one point looked like he was going to be able to make it across to the uh, to Neuvenhaus. Didn't. Then it's this. This is the moment where we see Easterbit connect. It still doesn't look like it's all the play, but then we realize that Joris Neuvenhaus having a really bad moment in the middle of this race, and he starts to uh, slowly but surely, Easterbit makes his way across, and we realize, wow, he's gapped Michael Van Turnout, and now he's on an absolute tear, and he's even gone through uh, Joris Neuvenhaus to take over the lead for the first time. The race just flipped in literally a lap and a half. Um, <laughs> just caught Neuenhaus for 25 seconds in a lap and went straight past him and immediately started opening up a gap and it looked like, oh, Isabit's just going to ride away with this one, but Michael Van Turnout then found a third, fourth, fifth wind <laughs> and came flying back towards the Belgian champion, but just ran out a little bit of energy towards the end and couldn't quite close it down at the end there. No, and Easterbit put together that last and final lap to really put a fork in Michael Van Tornhout for this one anyways. There's still a lot more to play, definitely tomorrow in Lilla and then those final races in the uh, in, down in Brussels University in that X2 Abad Commerce Trophy. So still lots to go there. Lars Vanderhart leading that series right now. And um, I believe uh, Matthew Vanderpool in second spot. Michael Van with, uh, als je heel eerlijk bent, halverwege de cross, had jij nog gedacht dat jullie bij Joris Nieuwenhuis zouden geraken? Ja, nee, eigenlijk niet. Uh, ik bleef eigenlijk zo wel op die, uh, die 15, 20 seconden lang. En uh, ja, ik denk dat we, dat we een beetje aan elkaar gewaagd waren. Natuurlijk moest ik wel van, van wat verder komen in de wedstrijd. En uh, ik denk dat dat mij wel een beetje de overwinning kost. Was je dan helemaal op op dat moment? Ja, eigenlijk wel. Uh, ik zat eigenlijk toen een beetje op de limiet. Uh, ik wist dat ik eigenlijk even moest uh, een ronde een beetje mijn eigen tempo zoeken. Maar natuurlijk uh, ja, zag ik wel dat Eli en Lars nog altijd bij mij in het huur langden. Dus uh, ja, dat was uh, ook geen oplossing. Dus ja, ik heb uh, geprobeerd uh, nog mee te gaan met jullie, maar dat was jammer genoeg. Uh, dat lukte niet. Hoe hebben jullie dat eigenlijk aangepakt, dat naar Joris Nieuwenhuis toe rijden? Oh ja, ik denk dat, dat ik het meeste kopwerk ik op, heb, heb gedaan. Dus, uh, ja, ik vind het een beetje spijtig dat jullie op het einde niet wachten op mij, dus, uh, maar goed, uh, het is nu zo, de wedstrijd is gereden en ik uh, ben tweede, dus daar moet ik mee leven. 
Nog één ding dan, dat relletje tussen jou en Ryan Kamp. Wat is daar eigenlijk precies gebeurd, kun je dat zeggen? Ja, ik denk dat Ryan nog met, uh, met wat revanche voelde zit van in Maldegem. Uh, ja, ik weet ook niet wat dat de bedoeling van is. Uh, dus ja, het was wel frustrerend voor mij dat ik daar uh, de wedstrijd door verlies. En uh, ja, ik denk dat hij 14 of 15 eindigt. Dus uh, ik weet niet wat zijn bedoeling is. Dus, uh, maar goed, uh, we zullen er elke keer moeten over spreken, denk ik. En wat zijn die revanchegevoelens naar Maldegem? Ja, daar wou hij ook ergens uh, binnenkant de bocht komen. En uh, natuurlijk sta ik ook niet zomaar mijn plaats af. En uh, ja, ik denk dat hij daar ook do- daardoor wat plaats verliest. En uh, ja, ik denk dat dat wat zijn revanche was. Maar, maar goed, uh, de wedstrijd is gereden. En dan was er wel een kleine woordenwisseling eventjes. Ja, dat moet. Hè. Ik denk uh, dat iedereen die graag uh, in de start uh, zijn positie afgeeft. En uh, goed, ik denk dat als Ryan zo wil spelen, is dat zijn, uh, zijn ding. Maar uh, ik heb nog terug mijn best gedaan en uh, ik sta nog terug op het podium. Dus uh, ja, ik heb mijn best gedaan. Merci voor je reactie. Ian? Yeah, so I think he was just explaining kind of today was leftovers from Maldigam, uh, yep. where they had a couple of coming togethers. And yeah, once again, it looked like Camp just kind of ran across the front of Michael Van Turnout. Didn't look like there was much in it. Um, and just looked like Michael Van Turnout frustrated from the other day, frustrated from that, and just kind of put a hand out and grabbed his, grabbed his bike, which, yeah, isn't, isn't really on. But those two need to have a chat, sort things out, because, yeah, kind of ruined both riders' races in the end. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, looked also like he Joris was Nieuwenhuis, talking a little bit. Oh, here we hear from Joris Nijvenhuis. Ja, ik had gewoon niet zo'n hele goede dag, denk ik. Um, Dat leek nog thans lang ja, anders. Ja, ja, nou ja, het, wat ik al hiervoor zei, het rondje ligt me wel heel goed. En uh, ik vloog er gewoon in zoals ik uh, normaal doe. Um, maar ja, mijn energielevel was gewoon uh, op tot gewoon op. Eigenlijk halverwege en uh, ja, dan kun je op dit rondje niet veel meer. Voelde je dat dan echt ineens plots leeglopen, benen vol en klaar? Um, nou ja, na twee, drie ronden had ik al wel door van oké, okay, dit ga ik niet uh, alle ronden nog volhouden op deze manier. Maar ik hoorde dit het wel dat het, uh, de, de, de tijden een beetje hetzelfde bleven. Um, dus ik hield nog hoop dat zij ook uh, iets van verval kenden. Maar ah, die laatste paar ronden kwam ik echt niet meer door. En dan kom ik al die klimmetjes niet meer lekker op. En dan, uh, ja, toen was het echt wel klaar. En eigenlijk is dat echt atypisch voor jou, hè? want normaal gezien als jij vertrekt, dan zien ze jou gewoon weg niet meer terug. Ja, ja het is denk ik voor mij wel een goede les dat ik uh, normaal dan uh, afgelopen weken heb ik eigenlijk alle afspraken die ik dan heb, thuis en zo allemaal, dat, die, 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 die doe ik dan gewoon allemaal na het WK, zeg maar. Dan is het echt zo'n, um, uh, ja, dan probeer ik echt die weken daarvoor gewoon leeg te houden in de planning en dan... Uh, misschien de afgelopen week iets te veel gedaan nog en dan uh, ja, energie gewoon op. Nu hoorde ik in de materiaalpost dat je extra gemotiveerd zou zijn voor vandaag, omdat je dacht dat vandaag oh. je verjaardag is. Ja. <laughs> maar dat lijkt dus niet zo te zijn. Morgen is het uh, zover, ja. dan word je 28. Ja. Dat heeft niet meegespeeld dat je ineens beseft van oei, ik nee. ben een dag te vroeg. Nee, um, ja, ik, ik, uh, ik hou niet zo van mijn verjaardag. Dus... <laughs> Ik, uh, ik ben daar nooit zo mee bezig. En normaal, ik ben nog wel een paar keer jarig geweest tijdens de Middelkerk. Dus in mijn hoofd was het van, oké, okay, Middelkerk komt, ik ben jarig. Maar dat uh, was niet zo. Morgen. Ja, dus alles op morgen dan om jezelf een mooie verjaardagscadeau te geven? Ja, ja inderdaad. Heel veel succes, dankjewel. Dankjewel. Ah. Ian, what do we have for that one? I think it just kind of explaining that the week after the World Championships taking that silver medal is a normal week as such and just yeah felt pretty good early on just a normal race and then just nothing he <laughs> just began to feel the legs completely go from underneath him and yeah as we all saw on our screens today just just left with nothing towards the last kind of 20 30 minutes of that race unfortunately for him yeah, I didn't catch the end there, what the, uh, what the chuckle was about, but um, I'll be for sure checking that out in the, uh, in the post-race uh, yeah, social media channels just to see exactly what that was all about. But uh, Neuven House, what can we say, man? He put, he put it together and you can see the big slow-mo shot on that person's phone there on the left-hand side doing, doing what they can to keep, it, uh, keep the memories strong. But Neuven House rode a great race. Despite being beaten in the end, it really did, uh, at the beginning, put it all together. And yeah, he looked to be on such a good day. But always in cyclocross, especially at this level, there can always be someone that's just a little bit better. Today it was Ely Gisebit and Michael Van Tornhout both putting together absolutely perfect rides and um, kept us on the edge of our seats, that's for sure. It certainly did. Certainly made for an exciting race today. 
but like you say, just looks so good for those opening laps, and you just felt like, oh, this is the new house that we've seen throughout the season, just go out, ride his own tempo, and it, it just be too fast for everyone else. But then Isabit just started taking back time and then overhauled him, just left him with nothing in the end. Michael Van Toren had out with his uh, with his child, just come up on the podium, bring up there. Probably a cool experience for uh, for whoever that is, just making their way up there. That'd be fun. You can see those big overall prize purse checks. Again, if you missed that earlier, uh, the overall winner, Easterbit, going to be taking home 25,000 smackers. Uh, actually, euros. Going to be taking home 25,000 euros. Joris Neuvenhaus going to be locking up second place in that series overall with uh, 16,000 uh, euros. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in the overall, uh, it will be, well, I need to look that one up, actually. I don't have that uh, right here. As, but I will tell you in just a second what it's going to be. Niels Van der Putten, uh is going to be taking that third spot on the podium, as it looks right now, although Michael Van Tornhout was close. I'd be curious to see. I think Niels Van der Putten did put together enough points today, Ian, to be able to take that. So it looks as though potentially the podium going to be, um, for the overall, it's going to be Easterbit, Neuvenhaus, and Van der Putten, all taking home 25,000, 16,000, and 10,000 euros, respectively. So very good. I agree with your maths. <laughs> Thank you very much. I got my Uncle Sean in the house today, Ian, uh, helping me out with the co-commentary here, putting together some numbers and pulling up some stats as we're going. So shout out to Uncle Sean, who's here with me today. Brilliant. <laughs> you always need a good co-commentator. Co-co-commentator in that case. Co-co. <laughs> Belgians will love that, Ian. Belgian champ in a proper West Flemish cross. Yeah, he's going to be the king for the day. For sure. I think when you turn up in a red Ferrari, you have to win the bike race. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. You do. <laughs> what do you think they're getting there? What do you think he's getting there? He's got definitely, that's a that's a satchel of things. That's like probably some some leeks, some, uh, maybe some West Vlieperin beer. Well, actually, excuse me, the sponsor of this one is not West Vlieperin, but who knows? There's going to be definitely some treats in that for the drive home, that's for sure. An array of vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's it does look like there's some leeks in there. Tell me I'm wrong. No, I think they are leeks. Yeah. <laughs> maybe a turnip or two. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Your winner, Ily Isurbit, followed up by Michael Van Tornhout and Joris Neuvenhaus round this one out here at uh, the North Sea Cross. One of the oldest uh, still existing crosses on the circuit. Starting out a very, very long time ago. First edition of this event in February 7th, 1959. It's a long time ago. Some real tradition behind this one. Had a few different venues over the years. Um, even this one's changed quite a bit since since they moved here. I certainly rode it in the opposite direction to what they do now. Um, and then, yeah, it's kind of changes. The more buildings that go up around, it's just. When the course isn't set up, it is literally just a bit of kind of wasteland between the town in the background, like you can see, all the the kind of flats, apartments, hotels up by the coast, and then just this main road. So it is literally just a, a small strip of land that one of the biggest international bike races takes place on. 
Yeah, I raced it too one year. Very, very icy conditions. I remember Sven Nace showing up on slick tires, uh, Ian. He showed up with those white, <laughs> uh, full slick tires. And I remember asking him at the time, like, what are you doing? Because like, I was running mud tires, and I, you know, I, I don't know. I, it's just there, the level that they had when I got there early, early on, um, I remember it uh, I remember it very well. But uh, he definitely knew what he was doing, you know, keeping that full tire patch in the ground. But uh, he was just out there. He told me he was just training on the day. But um, I have good memories here in Middle in Middle Kirka, having raced this one many times. Um, yeah, a really enjoyable course. Something different, too. It's not just all wide open power output. Very technical track with lots of just small ups and downs and bits and bumps. But uh, definitely deserving, uh, very deserving cross. But here he is, uh, going to be really happy with this, the young Belgian rider, Niels van der Putte, riding for the Alpes and de Kunic team, taking out third overall here in the Super Prestige Series. Thoroughly deserved from him, just super consistent this season and has just made a little step forward, I feel, within the races this year. One Super Prestige podium, and he's rewarded with third overall and 10,000 euros to boot. A really, really good rider, a really great guy as well. Uh, got to know Vendaputa over the years, and um, can't say enough good things about him. Really good head on his shoulders, and just a, a, a classy guy all around. So great to see him here pull out this kind of show of consistency all year long to take that third spot. Newenhouse second overall, couldn't make it three wins in the Super Prestige Series today, but did improve on his fourth here last year, moves up third on the day but again that consistency rewarded with a comfortable second place overall in the end yeah what can you say though east of it still maybe more to go for east of it um man he's still in third overall in the x2o bod commerce trophy he's definitely been most consistent rider over the last few years Ian, and this is kind of just you know confirming that once again that he's He's been consistent all year along. He's had a big dip in the middle part of his year and, and a bad virus that took him out from some of the World Cups, but he's still still able to hang on to everything, and he's still first overall here on this one. 100%. That was his fourth win in the Super Prestige, never off the podium in the Super Prestige this series, uh, this season, sorry. So, yeah, just goes to show the consistency that he's had within this series this year. And like you say, it's not done for him yet this season. His 49th career win today. He's going to definitely want to make that 50 before the season's done. Not to talk about the Ferrari again, Ian, but I just remembered that I think it said I think it said is again on the front, which is where I lived when I was over in Belgium. I don't know if you've ever been through the uh, streets of Isaham, but uh, curious to get the backstory on that Ferrari. I presume the Ferrari's from a from a dealer in Isagem, which I think is pretty close to where Isabit lives anyway. So yes. a good bit of advertising for them today on uh, live on Belgian TV mid-afternoon on a Saturday. Definitely some talent out of this West Flanders area. They definitely know their bike racers. Uh, had a lot of good friends over in Isaham over the years, and a lot of great mentors that came out of that area. So, um, yeah, a really great place to uh, to call home and a very humble place. I, I always enjoyed West Flanders. And um, although it can be, you know, quite gray this time of the year, but uh, <laughs> that's what Spain's all about. And um, definitely, definitely a really cool spot. Um, very flat, but lots of great canals and, uh, the people are really what make it special over there. So I believe we're going to be getting the overall results and today's results from this one. So 